O eternal and almighty God, from whom all power and wisdom come, we are assembled here before thee to frame such laws as may tend to the welfare and prosperity of our province. Grant, O merciful God, we pray thee, that we may desire only that which is in accordance with thy will, that we may seek it with wisdom and know it with certainty and accomplish it perfectly for the glory and honor of thy name and for the welfare of all our people. Amen. Please be seated. Good afternoon, everybody. Routine proceedings, introduction of bills. Committee reports, tabling of reports, ministerial statements, member statements. The Honorable, <clears throat> the Honorable Member for Large Maudier. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. On November 11th of this year, I had the honor of attending the annual Remembrance Day celebration organized and hosted by the Norwood St. Boniface Branch 43 of the Royal Canadian Legion. It is a somber occasion as we remember our young men and women who paid the ultimate sacrifice in order to secure freedom that we share here in Canada today. The Norwood St. Boniface Branch 43 of the Royal Canadian Legion received its charter in 1939 and has been proudly serving veterans in the community for the past 80 years. The mission of the Royal Canadian Legion is to serve veterans, which includes all branches of the military, as well as members of the RCMP and their families, in order to promote remembrance and serve communities and our country. A small group of dedicated volunteer members work year-round to promote remembrance with the veterans' dinners and services of remembrance. The annual Poppy Campaign funds collected are held in trust by the branch and used for the sole purpose of assisting Canadian veterans, their families in times of need which includes supporting emergency housing to homeless veterans. Branch 43 also supports youth in the community with four cadet corps by means of financial assistance and free usage of their facilities for meetings and fundraising. They also sponsor two Boy Scout troops and hold youth remembrance education along with children's Christmas parties and can cake breakfasts. The branch also supports seniors with various dances dinners, as well as social activities like darts, cribbage, billiards, and various Legion sport fun leagues. They also rent out their facility to the community for the very reasonable rates and assist in funeral planning and provide spaces for services. Norwood St. Boniface Branch 43 also supports the Military History Society of Manitoba by providing free exhibition space and storage for their collection. They also are involved in facilitating many of the charity groups in the community such as the Rectory Member, an event that raised funds and donations for clothing and blankets and other small items in Winnipeg's various homeless charities. Many volunteers from the branch also sit in a number of provincial... The member's time has expired. Is there a leave to allow the member to complete his statement? Leave has been granted. The Honourable Member for Large Maudier. Many volunteers from the branch also <coughs> sit in a number of provincial legion committees, such as the Joint Hospital, Legion Housing and the RCL Sports Foundation. Madam Speaker, I ask that uh, my members and our fellow members here in the chamber rise and recognize some people here in the gallery with me today. Branch 43, President Faye Levac, Vice President Laura Lukey, Third Vice President Lillian Jensen, and Executive Member Dave Montgomery. Let's give him a applause. The Honourable Member for the Maples. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recently had the honour of attending Wayfinder's 10-year anniversary celebrating October the 17th. It was a well-organised dinner event and was attended by roughly 200 people. The Wayfinder is a programme that seeks to lead youth through mentorship and various educational activities. It went from supporting 35 students in its first year to supporting 430 students this academic year. The main goal of this organization is centered on promoting academic success. It does this by working closely with teachers, principals, students, and their families. It has served over 600 students, and by the end of grade nine, 60% of their participating students 
are on track for graduation. And the program has a 79% post-secondary entrance rate. Wayfinders Tangier University was celebrating celebration on how they have grown as a community and the opportunity to reflect on their plans for the future. The students who take part in this program come from different backgrounds. One thing that sets them up apart is their willingness to learn, their dedication, and their consistency. Wayfinder is committed to help, helping them realize and develop their talent and key life skills. Annually, they offer a series of small group of mentorship opportunities, and they look forward to continue providing relationship-based mentorship. They encourage their students to take part in their career exploration experience, which help them obtain practical knowledge about different professions. Wayfinders are also invested in providing cultural identity, health, recreational, art, community development focused programs. Wayfinder, you are doing a great job. Thank you for making a difference in many people's lives. We have The Honorable Member for the Maples. Madam Speaker, I ask for that, uh, leave to have the name of my guest added into Hansard. Is there a leave to include those names of his guests in Hansard? Leave has been granted. For their member statements. The Honorable Member for Laverandre. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Earlier this month, I had the honor of participating in the launch of Operation Red Nose for the Labrocri Steinbach area. Two of the guest speakers were Dr. Chantel Frechette and Dr. Patrick Fredette of the St. Anne Hospital. They spoke on what they have seen while working at the hospital and the devastating effects of impaired driving on families. There are still too many impaired drivers on the roads, especially during the holiday season. And anything we can do to reduce this number will lower the risk of accidents and help keep loved ones safe. Operation Red Nose helps by taking impaired drivers off the roads on the days that they are operating. Simply call them and they will come and get you and your vehicle safely home at no charge. All they ask is for a donation for their service. There are many Operation Red Nose operating across Manitoba. In my constituency of La Verandre, there are two, the La Brokerie Steinbach and the St. Malo. I would like to thank all the organizers and volunteers that make Operation Red Nose possible, especially during the busy holiday season. I would like to encourage everyone to volunteer with an Operation Red Nose in their area. And finally, if you see someone you think should not be driving, advise them about Operation Red Nose and the great service it provides. Thank you. Last Saturday, the MLA for Tyndall Park and I brought together constituents at a forum on improving care and preventing tragedies in Manitoba's personal care homes. We looked at what a tragedy is in such a home. Tragedies include fires and falls where a hip is broken or a head is injured. Tragedies also include when a family member is not allowed to visit their loved one in the personal care home or when a person dies in a home unhappy and angry about the quality of care he or she received. We had four excellent panelists. Connie Newman, Executive Director of the Manitoba Association of Senior Centers, emphasized the importance of having someone who is an advocate for care home residents. Michelle Gavronsky, President of MGEU, discussed staffing levels. The care needs of residents are much greater today than 1986, when I which I understand was the date of the last review of staffing levels in personal care homes. Dolores Minkus Hoffley, whose husband is in a personal care home, talked of the need to improve staffing and training for personnel in personal care homes. Robert Rose Jr., son of former St. Vital MLA Bob Rose, spoke of the overuse of antipsychotic medications for residents like his father. The forum brought to light numerous disturbing concerns. There were also many suggestions for improvements. 
There is a need for review of staffing levels and training requirements for those working in personal care homes in our province, as was emphasized at the forum and in a recent March report. While some personal care homes are doing a good job, others are falling short. One suggestion for action is to better identify best practices in personal care homes which are doing a good job and to use this to improve personal care homes where there are shortcomings. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Merci, Miigwech. The Honourable Member for Thompson. Madam <coughs> Speaker, our youth are the leaders of tomorrow. Society benefits immensely when youth are given the opportunity to be active and involved giving input on issues affecting northern communities and Manitoba at large. In Thompson, a Youth Shadow Council initiative, known as Student Perspective Expressed at City Council, SPEAK, was recently developed. The beginning of the initiative goes back to April when 28 students, grade 12, along with other students from Artie Parker Collegiate, focused on the ongoing issues that affected their ability to get to school. They teamed up and tried to come up with ways to bring attention to City Council on this. This was a significant step in spearheading SPEAK initiative. One of the students sat on the Transit Ad Hoc Committee as a student representative on issues surrounding the transit service. This fall, students at Artie Parker Collegiate began working with Thompson City Council towards implementing student representation. And this November, Thompson City Council approved five student positions on Council, one to sit on, sit on City Council and the rest to sit on subcommittee seats. Five students were chosen to participate and speak and have opportunity to be, contribute to parks and recreation, communication, public safety, finance and administration, and other subcommittees. They will take part for the remainder of the school year as a non-voting member who will present student and youth concerns and the, to the viewpo viewpoints to the city. This is a clear example of positive results in empowering our youth through involvement in the decision-making and making government at governmental levels. I would like to congratulate and thank the youth for their opportunity and advocating for young people in Thompson. Well, the Honourable Member for Thompson. I ask for leave to include the names of the members of SPEAK into the Hansard. Is there leave to include the names of those uh, members in Hansard? Leave has been granted. Prior to oral questions, we have some guests in the public gallery that I would like to introduce to you. We have a Nigerian delegation <clears throat> that includes chiefs, community leaders, cultural ambassadors, and professors. <clears throat> they are accompanied by a student from Winnipeg. The delegation is in the city for ASA Day, which is an annual event that promotes culture in Canada. The delegation are guests of the Honourable Members for Point Douglas, Union Station and St. John's. On behalf of all Honourable Members, we welcome you here to the Manitoba Legislature. Also in the public gallery from Carberry Collegiate, we have 17 grade nine students under the direction of Reagan Dick, and this group is located in the constituency of the Honorable Minister of Indigenous and Northern Relations. On behalf of all honorable members here, we welcome you to the Manitoba Legislature as well. <laughs> Oral questions. The honorable member for St. John. Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, Northern Manitobans are being held for days, weeks, and in some cases even months without a bail hearing. This is simply an injustice and amounts to repeated constitutional violations on behalf of Manitobans. As I noted yesterday, the Minister's response to the issue has been less than nothing. Manitoba's court operations and prosecution services have fewer staff than they did three years ago. Rohit Gupta, a Winnipeg lawyer, told the press his clients are being, and I quote, adjourned down a black hole. This is on the minister's watch. Why isn't he taking this seriously? And why won't he call a comprehensive review into this issue? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and uh, certainly uh, a recycled question from just yesterday. 
I can tell you that our government uh, views the situation in northern Manitoba, in fact, across justice. Uh, we take this issue very seriously. Uh, we certainly want to make sure that people all across Manitoba have timely access to justice. We know, and the record shows, the NDP knew there was a problem. They did nothing about it. Madam Speaker, we're moving on various fronts to make amends to what's been left undone by the NDP, including, Madam Speaker, a commitment to spend $11 million to renovate the courthouse. Here. The Honourable Member for St. John's on a supplementary question. Miigwech, I will continue to ask this question every <clears throat> single day until the Minister actually starts doing something on behalf of Northern Manitobans. We now have hundreds of people who were receiving video conferencing for bail hearings and who are now forced to navigate a judicial system that has collapsed in the north. Immediate action is needed. The minister can't tell me how many additional Crown prosecutors, if any, have been diverted to northern Manitoba. He won't commit to a comprehensive review. Why won't he do anything on this issue? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Well, Madam, Madam Speaker, we are committed to making changes there, and we've made changes already. Right. Uh, in fact, just in, uh, in January, upcoming in January, we're going to be increasing the number of days uh, for bail court from uh, two and a half to five. Certainly, that will have a fundamental yeah. difference there as well. The NDP chose to ignore Thompson and Northern Manitoba. They did nothing at all. In fact, the technology was not even in place to help with bail court. There was no video technology available in Thompson. There was no Wi-Fi even available in Thompson. Madam Speaker, we made investments in Thompson already, and there's another $11 million investment to come. The Honourable Member for St. John's on a final supplement. Which, Madam Speaker, timely access to justice in northern Manitoba has simply collapsed under this minister's leadership. And watch one of the few tools the courts had to deal with the crushing backlog uh, was video conferencing. But that's been eliminated now, Madam Speaker. Simply put, things have gotten worse, not better, under the minister's leadership. His capital and other vague commitments are far <laughs> off in the future and are doing nothing to deal with the issue immediately. What is he going to do about this issue, and will he commit to a comprehensive and independent review today? The Honourable Minister of Justice. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Oh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And certainly the NDP ignored the issue. I know we have a committee uh, struck by the Chief Justice of Manitoba, the Chief Judge, pardon me. Uh, certainly she's working with uh, the Crown Services, uh, Judiciary, uh, Probation, Sheriffs uh, as well. Uh, there has been some solutions put on the table. Uh, certainly we're using resources out of Winnipeg as well to help uh, fill a need in northern Manitoba. And certainly there's a lot of things happening. We are ongoing recruitment of Crowns and Clerks, ongoing training of Crowns and Clerks in there. And certainly, we have made a difference for the people of Manitoba. We realize there's more work to do to provide timely access to justice for Manitobans, but we made a commitment to do it, and we will get it done. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Flynn Flon. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Liquor Mart employees are fearful that someone will be killed or seriously injured, more so than what Randy Lee Chase was in the recent theft last week. It seems this government has waited until somebody got hurt before they decided to implement new security measures. And while those security measures are welcome and a small step in the right direction, it's not the ultimate solution. The root causes seem need to be addressed. Will the minister convene a summit, including community, social idea. services, law enforcement, unions, and the province to address liquor thefts? Very good idea. The Honourable Minister for Crown Services. Well, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And uh, again, uh, our thoughts, and I'm sure are echoed throughout this House and the rest of Manitoba, are with uh, Ms. Randy Lee Chase, uh, that suffered an, a, a terrible, terrible event, along with her uh, colleagues and, uh, and customers that were 
in the store at that time, uh, Madam Speaker. And uh, I can tell you that uh, efforts uh, have been and will continue to be moving forward to ensure that we can pr provide safety for our customers and our employees. The Honourable Member for Flintstone on a supplementary question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thoughts and prayers, quite simply, aren't going to cut it. Mm -hmm. We should be protected by our employer, Liquor Mart employee Randy Lee Chase emphasized on her video posted on social media, and she is absolutely right. The stresses and violence Liquor Mart employees are facing is unprecedented. 10 to 30 thefts are occurring on a daily basis. Employees themselves feel like they have to lock and man the doors by themselves. And the holiday season is fast approaching. Employees are fearful the situation will just get dramatically worse. What further measures is the minister taking to ensure Manitoba liquor and lottery employees remain safe while they're at work? The Honourable Minister of Crown Services. Well, thank you again, uh, Madam Speaker. And, and employees at the Tyndall Market uh, Liquor Mart store went through a very serious and traumatic, a traumatic incident last week, and we all recognize that for sure. Manitoba Liquor and Lotteries has and continues to ensure uh, resources are available, Madam Speaker, to support uh, involved uh, uh, staff involved at the Tyndall store, including the availability, availability of counselling through employee and family assistance programs, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Flint Flon on a final supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Former Liquor Mart Manager Leo Dame retired because he couldn't handle the increase in liquor thefts and lack of action. The physical and verbal abuse employees are enduring quite simply can't go on. These are accept unacceptable work conditions and employees shouldn't be expected to go to work in those kind of conditions. The number of employees taking stress leave has been on the rise. So what is the minister prepared to do to first ensure that all Liquor Mart employees are getting the resources and supports that they need to address emotional and physical trauma? And what is the minister doing to ensure workers are safe in their workplace? The Honourable Minister of Crown Services. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, as I mentioned in my second answer, uh, counselling through uh, employee and family uh, assistance program is available, uh, Madam Speaker. And I, I know this has been an evolving issue over the last several weeks and months. And uh, MBLL uh, has, has put in many uh, theft deterrent measures. And I'll just put a few on the record, Madam Speaker. Special duty constables, bag checks, uh, entry display monitors, lockable display cases, product display cards, restricted access to areas of control, bottle locks, just to name a few, Madam Speaker. We're also moving forward with the controlled entrance, entrance project for this site. Uh, has been underway for several weeks, Madam Speaker, and uh, at the Tyndall Market. And this is just one store. Every store in the City of Winnipeg will receive the same courtesy. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Fort Gary. The UN released its annual emissions gap report today, and the news is not good. Without drastic action, our planet is headed towards warming of 3.2 degrees uh, Celsius in less than 100 years. Yet the Palliser government refuses to establish credible science-based emission targets. They refuse to take action to reduce our emissions. Instead, they make retroactive cuts when they need uh, for action is greater than ever. The Palliser government's belt tightening continues to target the organizations and services that help better our communities, our health and our environment. Will the minister commit to setting the United Nations emission targets today? The Honourable Minister of Families. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and I thank the member for the question. We do know back in the dark days of the previous NDP uh, government, uh, Madam Speaker, that uh, they set targets to deal with climate change, uh, and they, they never met a target that they set back in those days, That's Madam right. Speaker. We know on this side of the House, our government is taking Order. steps to, to clean up the mess of the previous NDP government. The Minister is working diligently to do so as the Premier and all my colleagues on this side of the House to ensure that we have a cleaner, greener society here for all Manitoba families. The Honourable Member for Fort Gary on a supplementary question. 
The list of victims of the Pallister government's cuts grows by the day. Green Action Centre, Manitoba Eco Network, Climate Change Connection. And it took seven months for them to be notified that their funding would be cut. Hundreds of thousands of dollars that these organizations rely upon to help Manitobans reduce their emissions and impact is gone. Climate Change Connection is forced to go down to two part-time staff. Green Action Centre was forced to lay off staff and make major cuts to sustainable transportation programs. And Manitoba Eco Network may be forced to shut their doors altogether. Will the Minister reverse her cuts to help reduce Manitobans' emissions today? The Honourable Minister of Crown Services. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, I know uh, we... Uh, for the member, we did answer this question yesterday, and I'll certainly put it on the record again today uh, for the member opposite. Uh, the department, and I know the minister is working very hard, the department will launch a centralized grant portal uh, with uh, municipal relations and sport, culture and heritage, uh, Madam Speaker, for all organizations to apply with more outcome-based expectations and measures for funding as of April 1, 2020. There you go. <clears throat> The Honourable Member for Fort Gary on a final supplementary. The Minister can't hide from the facts, Madam Speaker. Manitoba has already seen temperatures increase greater than the national average, and the impacts of increased emissions, warming temperatures and unprecedented climate events leaves our society Order. and our environment vulnerable. We are already seeing the devastating impacts of climate change close to home with droughts, floods and intense storms, and it's being felt in our northern communities, our environment even more, uh, with reduced winter road season and a loss of habitat. And sadly, it's our youth that will pay the price for a lack of political will and action to address climate change. Will the minister commit to setting United Nations emission targets and reverse her cuts to help achieve those targets today? The Honourable Minister of Crown Services. Oh, thank you again, Madam Speaker. And uh, NGO funding is moving to a new uh, centralized <coughs> intake grant management process uh, Madam Speaker, for 2021 that will provide focused opportunities, Madam Speaker, to NGOs to support climate and green plan. Madam Speaker, unlike, unlike the NDP uh, government at the time, it's just uh, they go ahead and spend money where they thought they were going to. Matter of fact, Madam Speaker, it was written on the back of a napkin how they were going to save the environment, Madam Speaker. Where the NDP failed the environment in Manitoba, Madam Speaker, we'll get it right. The Honourable Member for Thompson. Madam Speaker, the Minister has committed to consultations on, di with disab on disabilities program. But there are one thing she needs to make immediately. She needs to ensure that the most recent diagnosis assessments are used when diagnosing disabilities. At, the, at current, the Minister's department is using outdated diagnostic tools, leaving hundreds of Manitobas without, Manitobans without access to su the supports they rightfully deserve. That's not right. Will the Minister make the change immediately? The Honourable Minister of Families. Well, Madam Speaker, the member opposite is part of a political party, the NDP, that was in power in this province for uh, 17 years, wow. Madam Speaker. Clearly, it was not a priority for them back then, and now all of a sudden, the member opposite wants to make this immediate uh, change, uh, Madam Speaker. I will tell you that we are working closely with members of the disabilities community. In fact, just yesterday in Brandon, uh, we had a consultation meeting with. Uh, with members of the community to ensure that we move forward in an appropriate funding uh, level for uh, persons with disabilities in our province. Members opposite saw fit to, um, uh, to fund members of the disabilities community in the way of EIA, Madam Speaker. We want to Order. ensure that those people are able to live their lives uh, with dignity, Madam Speaker, on an appropriate funding level. We will continue to consult with them on what that will look like. Fair. The Honourable Member for Thompson on a supplementary question. Madam Speaker, to be clear, this is not my request, but former Justice and Health Minister Jim McRae. Mr. McRae serves as the Minister's Chair for Social Services Appeal Board. Since 2016, he has advised the Minister on this issue, explaining that the Department relies on outdated diagnostic criteria. He expressed his concern as he continues to hear appeals 
from individuals who are requiring intensive supports but are, being fun but are not being funded by the department. Will the minister stop this three-year delay and listen to Mr. McRae? The Honourable Minister of Families. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And who we're listening to is persons with disabilities in the community. When they called during the election campaign in a, debil in, in a um, disabilities debate that we had uh, under Disability Vote Matters, uh, Madam Speaker, they were calling for an alternative income program, and that's exactly what we are going to deliver for them. And that's why we are holding uh, consultation meetings across province again yesterday. Yes, we just met in Brandon. Uh, we also met in Brandon uh, earlier today and yesterday, and meetings continue. Uh, there uh, with uh, the Association for Manitoba Municipalities, and I want to thank all of those who participated in the various meetings uh, there. We are listening to Manitobans, and that's what we will continue to do, unlike members opposite. The Honourable, Honourable Member for Charleston on a final supplementary. Madam S Speaker, that is the sound you hear of the Minister kicking the can down the road. She should take action now, as Mr. McRae advised. I table copies of Mr. McRae's advice to the minister. He explains for, that for the last three years, he has urged the minister and the department to update their diagnostic assessments for disabilities. And the, the appeal board is, in fact, using these tools, but the department has not been. They should adopt them. This should be resolved years ago. The minister should do the right thing. Will she follow Mr. McRae's advice? The Honourable Minister of Families. Well, Madam Speaker, speaking of uh, taking action, uh, the members opposite had 17 years to take action on this very issue, Madam Speaker, but they chose not to. We are listening to people within the disabilities community to ensure that we get it right for them. They have asked for an alternative Order. income program. We are consulting with them, and where members opposite failed, we will deliver. And we'll get it. The Honourable Member for Notre Dame. Thank you, Madam Speaker. No child should ever have to go to school hungry. Organizations like the Child Nutrition Council of Manitoba provide breakfast, snack, and lunch programs to make sure our children stay engaged and succeed. Targeted programs like nutrition and recreation programs help keep marginalized students safe and can result in increased attendance <coughs> at school. Will the minister's K-12 review include a plan to implement a universal nutrition program? The Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. The member opposite is asking me what is in the K-12 review. I suppose if I answered that, she would then accuse me of interference. Of course, I don't know what's in the K-12 review because they haven't uh, returned the review yet. I do know that 15,000 Manitobans did participate uh, online and in person to provide advice on education. I have no doubt that they'll talk about uh, some things uh, that are important beyond uh, simply the education system when it comes to learning, and I expect to see that report in February, and I look forward to the great advice that Manitobans have provided us. The Honourable Member for Notre Dame on a supplementary question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Every child should be given the best opportunity to succeed at school to ensure a bright future. Sadly, the demand for food programs continues to increase. This past year, the Child Nutritional Council of Manitoba served 30,500 students, up from 28,000 students in 2017-18. And while demand is increasing, organizations like the Child Nutrition Council are not getting the supports they need to fund schools' nutrition programs. Their latest annual report said, without an increase in funding for grants, the percentage of calculated food costs we are able to grant school nutrition programs has been steadily decreasing from 18% in 2016-17 to just over 10% in 2019. The member's time has expired. The Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you very uh, much, Madam Speaker. This is not, of course, a new issue, uh, ensuring that young people go to school uh, with appropriate nutrition has been uh, an issue for many, many years. Madam Speaker, our government's already taken significant action. I was pleased to be at the opening of the uh, new uh, cafeteria at St. John's a few weeks ago. We have 
uh, young people who are involved in preparing meals, where they can get uh, appropriate meals at an affordable price, uh, Madam Speaker. That was an initiative that was done together with the private sector. Uh, Madam Speaker, they had a great celebration when the cafeteria opened because we can partner with individuals. I look forward to the K-12 Commission reporting back and seeing what other advice you may have, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Notre Dame on a final supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Manitoba has the highest food bank usage rate in the country and the highest percentage of children using food banks. This alone should send a clear message to the government. Poverty is a growing issue and nutrition programs are highly needed. But poverty isn't on this government's radar. The word does not appear one time in the throne speech. The Manitoba Teacher Society released a report this June that ties educational outcomes directly with food security for children. Will the minister listen to our teachers and commit to taking meaningful steps to address poverty and increase supports to these nutrition programs and organizations. The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, Madam Speaker, I already outlined in my second response some of the action that our government has taken when it comes to nutrition. Uh, that second response would have provided more action uh, in the time that we've been in government than was ever provided under 17 years of the NDP, Madam Speaker. I'm proud of this government uh, for the work that it's done in reducing poverty generally, including <coughs> Uh, child poverty. We've seen reports where we've seen improvement of those who are living uh, in poverty for the first time in many years, I would say a couple of decades, Madam Speaker. That member opposite and all the members opposite had an opportunity uh, during the time that they were in government to do something. They did nothing. We're taking action where they didn't, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for the Paul Kamisak. Madam Speaker. The Auditor General's recent report found that information in the Child and Family Service Information System needs to be updated. The database was not complete or accurate, and the Department did not provide enough support to, ag to agencies to manage it. Yet this inaccurate system is what the Minister now uses to state the numbers of children in care and for funding. When will the Minister update the database, and will she, sh and will she put further resources to ensuring that it is accurate? The Honourable Minister of Families. Well, I thank the member uh, for the question, Madam Speaker, and uh, certainly the landscape is changing uh, with respect to child welfare in our country. We do know that uh, on January 1st of 2020, the federal government is planning on uh, proclaiming um, Bill C-92, Madam Speaker, which is going to significantly change the, the landscape of child welfare in our country. While the Auditor General did a report, a snapshot in time, uh, we've made significant changes already. In fact, we came out with our own review uh, of some of the challenges within uh, the foster care system. Madam Speaker, uh, we found commonalities between the Auditor General's report uh, as well as our review as well, Madam Speaker. Uh, we've already started to take action on that, but again, the, level, the, uh, the playing field is changing, Madam Speaker. The landscape is changing, and we need to work with uh, everyone to the ensure that time we... has expired. <clears throat> the Honourable Member for the Paw Kamisak. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Southern First Nations Network of Care includes the majority of children in the child welfare system. They recently lost access to the database due to a cyber attack. As a result, the, the authority says there is no access to any sort of computers and the data is currently inaccessible. To be clear, the majority of the child welfare information in this province is currently inaccessible. What is the minister doing to address this serious crisis? The Honourable Minister of Families. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and uh, I'll inform the, the House today that at the end of the workday on uh, Friday, November 22nd, uh, the Southern First Nations Network of Care notified uh, our government of a security breach and virus within its computer network and that eight of its ten agencies had been impacted as a result of that. I know right now that uh, officials from the Department of Families are working with the Southern First Nations Network of Care to ensure that we deal with this in an expeditious uh, manner, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for the Paw Kamisak. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This most recent incident really highlights the vulnerability of the Child and Family Service Information System, and it should be a wake-up call to the Minister to take action. The Auditor General has said 
The database is a, sh is in, is a shambles, and this recent cyber attack shows just how vulnerable the system is. When will the minister put significant new resources to improving the system? Ego Seth. The Honourable Minister of Families. Well, Madam Speaker, our government was elected to clean up the mess of the previous NDP government, and child welfare is uh, certainly a significant uh, part of that, Madam Speaker. Uh, we have uh, had discussions with um, the Southern First Nation Network of Care to, uh, to ensure that uh, they put together a service delivery plans, so we're, we're awaiting uh, for that, Madam Speaker, from them. We've also offered support, IT support, uh, on site in the Southern First Nation Network of Care uh, to assess the, the damage and assist in um, containing and, and mitigating uh, harm, Madam Speaker. Uh, we will continue to work with the Southern First Nation Network of Care. It's important, Madam Speaker, that, uh, that we get this right and that we deal with the immediate issue at hand, and that is uh, the compromised IT system uh, in the Southern Authority. We've offered that support to them, and we will continue to work in a collaborative way. The Honourable Member for River Heights. Yeah, Madam Speaker, one of the sad stories to hit the news in recent days was about families of residents in personal care homes in Ontario who were being prevented or severely limited in being able to see their loved ones. Similar situations are occurring here in Manitoba, with family members being prevented or severely restricted in being able to see their loved ones in a personal care home. There is an urgent need to address this. Will this have to come to a court case, as in Ontario, or will the minister take action to make sure that close relatives will be able to visit their loved ones while they are in personal care homes? The Honourable Minister of Health, Seniors and Active Living. The member for River Heights uh, referenced a recent panel that he held, and he referenced Connie Newman. That is a name that is familiar to many of us, who is the Executive Director of the Manitoba Association for Senior Centres. We thank Connie and her organization for their ongoing uh, endorsement of our government's uh, uh, initiatives to reduce ambulance fees. Uh, she made uh, other supportive comments of our government when we recently uh, continued to provide the flu vaccine in personal care homes at a higher dose to keep a resident safe. Uh, we thank uh, Connie Newman and her organization for her representations that she continues to say we're going in the right direction. The Honourable Member for River Heights on a supplementary question. Yeah, typically my question not answered. Those who have to live in personal care homes and their families should be able to be sure that the days residents spend there, which may include the last few days of their life, will be happy ones, where they can receive good care. It is very sad, as I heard from a daughter of one resident, when the last words of a person who passed away in a personal care home were about how awful it was to be there. Currently, conditions in some care personal care homes in Manitoba are falling far short of what they should be, as we heard at our recent forum. What actions will the Minister of Health be taking to immediately improve conditions in Manitoba's personal care homes and to prevent tragedies from occurring? The Honourable Minister of Health, Seniors and Active Living. The, minister, uh, the member for River Heights mentioned that another panelist he had at his uh, event was Michelle Garonsky. That is a name that is very familiar to those of us in the chamber. Of course, she is the president of the MGEU, Manitoba Government Employees Union. Uh, recently, we were uh, pleased to see the representation votes take place under Bill 29. Manitoba had over 180 unique collective bargaining agreements, and now with those uh, votes having taken place, while I know MGEU uh, representation did diminish, the real winners are Manitobans with under, under 40 representative unions now representing labour in the province of Manitoba. The Honourable Member for River Heights on a final supplementary. Now, Madam Speaker, again, no answer. Michelle Kovronsky did say that there has not been a review of staffing and training in personal care homes since 1986. The minister should undertake such a review as soon as possible. Dr. Malcolm Dope, Dope at the Manitoba Centre for Health Policy has published a series of indicators of the performance of Winnipeg's personal care homes. He found some care homes are doing well while others are performing poorly. The minister should review what well-functioning homes are doing and use this information to improve conditions and prevent tragedies at poorly performing homes. Will the minister do this? 
The Honorable Minister of Health, Seniors and Active Living. I remind all members there are uh, measures, there are standards, there are procedures in place in all personal care homes across Manitoba in order to keep people safe. If the member has specific information that he wants to share, I invite him to bring it forward. We are proud of the investments that we are making in, in personal care homes across Manitoba. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Interlake, Gimli. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Unlike members opposite, our government understands the value of using proven initiatives to re reduce crime that improves public and community safety. We yep. know that we need to reduce the number of individuals in our justice system and address violent crime in our communities, including in northern Manitoba and Thompson. Recently, our government announced a major investment that will help ensure Manitobans in crisis get the supports they need in the city of Thompson. Can the Minister of Justice please share the details of this investment with the House? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Our Safer Streets, Safer Lives auction plan is investing $16 million over four years in new community law enforcement initiatives. Our government is investing more than $2.1 million over three years to expand street reach programming in Thompson and to enhance the community mobilization hub. These programs have proven very effective in other communities. The expansion of the community mobilization hub in Thompson will enhance access to services for people at risk across the community. And the street reach program will increase protection and safety for sexually exploited youth in northern Manitoba and reduce the likelihood of them moving or being trafficked to Winnipeg. Madam Speaker, we look forward to working with the fine people of Thompson to make the community safer for everyone. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Kuwait Nook. Madam Speaker, yesterday the Premier conceded that he has failed in his leadership of the Lake Manitoba and Lake St. Martin Channel. He just couldn't get the job done, despite promising to get it done within his first term. It turns out he likely won't complete it within the next four years either. It's a clear broken promise and a failure of leadership. Has, why has the Premier promised what he couldn't deliver? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker, and I appreciate uh, the question from the member opposite. Uh, we are certainly uh, moving forward on that particular program and that particular project. Uh, we are consulting with uh, our friends in northern Manitoba on so many fronts in relation to that uh, particular project. Uh, we would hope uh, maybe the opposition members will uh, call their uh, cousins in, uh, in Ottawa and we can get the federal Ottawa Liberal government on side and help me move this project forward. The Honourable Member for Kuwait Nook on a supplementary Madam Speaker, question. To be clear, in 2016, the Premier stood on the shores of Lake Manitoba and promised Manitobans that he would complete the channel within four years. He mocked consultation as a bunch of coffee parties and that only he alone knew how to move dirt. As usual, Madam Speaker, it just wasn't true. If he committed in good faith to conduct meaningful consultation three years ago, they would be far further along than they are now. Why does this government only deflect and blame others for their failure of leadership? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. We made a commitment to move this project forward. Right. We know the NDP now see urgency in it, but they didn't for 17 years, no, Madam are. Speaker. Let 17 years they stood by the, the wayside, let the communities in northern Manitoba flood out, and we here are now cleaning up the mess the NDP left. Madam Speaker, we are consulting with First Nations communities uh, that are impacted. Uh, obviously, there's changes in the programming in terms of the process going forward. Uh, we're, we're forced by the federal government to, uh, to make alternative plans as we move forward. But the consultation <laughs> continues, and we still intend to get this project built. Here, here, here. The Honourable Member for Kuwait Nook on a final supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Premier could have, ha have long completed consultation if he had simply committed to a meaningful process from the beginning, and he can still do so, but he's looking for someone to blame for his failure of leadership. He promised the channel within his first term and didn't deliver. He can stop the blame game and consult in good faith with communities. <laughs> Will he do so? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Well, Madam Speaker, there's been no stronger proponent for this project than the Premier of Manitoba. <laughs> The NDP 
MPP had 17 years to move this project. Nothing happened. We have almost completed the engineering design for the outlet channel. Carter. We've almost completed the design and the engineering component of the outlet channels. Uh, we continue to do consultations. Uh, negotiations between province of Manitoba and the federal government continue. Madam Speaker, the Premier has made a commitment. Our government has made a commitment. We will get the job done. Yeah. The Honourable Member for St. Vital. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I want to welcome the Minister to his new portfolio as post-secondary education. And I want to relay to him our concern over this government's decision for post-secondary institutions. Operating grants have been frozen. Operating grants uh, have, have been cut. Tuition increased, in fact, fastest rates in the country. It's simply not the kind of investment that we need to ensure quality learning and that we have a strong workforce in our future. Does the minister intend to stop freezes and cuts and, and increase funding to our post-secondary institutions? The Honourable Minister of Economic Development and Training. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. First off, I want to congratulate the University of Manitoba for the appointment of Michael Benarock. Also, I want to take time to thank Dr. Bernard for his leadership in working with the provincial government, along with the universities and colleges, on making sure we have the right skill set going forward. I can tell you we've had two meetings with him now, one as recently as Monday, and the attitudes towards education is very progressive. I assure the member opposite, universities and colleges are paying attention and they want to be part of the change. The Honourable Member for St. Vital on a supplementary question. Madam Speaker, I appreciate that the Minister is in touch with the heads of the departments of the post-secondary institutions. However, if he consults with his own annual reports of his departments, he'll discover that the investment to college seats has declined and his government support for apprenticeships has not been there. It really makes no sense that this government is on one side pressuring institutions for workforce outcomes while the government is also reducing their commitment for training and that directly ties to employment. Why say one thing but do the exact opposite, Madam Speaker? The Honourable Minister of Educa uh, uh, Economic thank you, Development uh, and Madam Training. Speaker. The Women's Executive Network has named two University of Manitoba researchers the Ratty Faculty of Health Services in Canada's Most Powerful Women in 2019. And researchers Dr. Osher and Taylor Morso, a PhD student and Valor Scholar, have been appointed to this prestigious award. The University of Manitoba has had 17 women affiliated with the institution have been named Canada's Most Powerful Women in the Top 100. The Honourable Member for St. Vital on a final supplementary. Madam Speaker, there is no doubt that our post-secondary institutions have had tremendous accomplishments and in fact they know the best way to educate and train Manitobans for today and the future. The Palestra government's invest investments and in fact their lack of investments and their interference with our post-secondary institutions are not what's needed right now. If this minister was serious about this, he would lead by example and he would restore what has been cut to our college seats and apprenticeships at that directly linked to on-the-job training and employment. Will he do this, or is this just another excuse and more spin? The Honourable Minister of Economic Development and Training. Uh, Madam Speaker, the member is just wrong. <laughs> The Honourable Member for Southdale. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Since taking office in 2016, our government has demonstrated a clear commitment to providing better support for survivors of domestic and sexual violence. We recently passed legislation which expanded the existing early lease termination provisions for survivors of domestic violence and stalking. And yesterday, the minister responsible for status of women announced amendments to the Employment Standards Code that will broaden the current domestic violence leave to include survivors of interpersonal violence. 
Can the minister explain what these changes will mean for survivors and why these changes are so important? The Honourable Minister for Status of Women. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member from Southdale for that very important question. Our government is committed to addressing interpersonal family violence and domestic violence, and I am proud to share that just yesterday our government announced important amendments to the Employment Standards Act. Victims of sexual violence and stalking, regardless of the perpetrator, will now be eligible to take protective leaves of absence. The new amendments will allow victims to take 10 consecutive or intermittent days of leave per year and up to 17 weeks per year in one continuous period. This bill will also allow employees who are a parent or a caregiver to a child or dependent to take the leave if their child or dependent experiences interpersonal violence. Six other provinces have already implemented this legislation. The time and we has plan expired. to do more for women. <laughs> The time for oral questions has expired. Oh, the uh, Honourable Official Opposition House Leader. Yeah, I apologize, Madam Speaker. Is there a leave to include the names of our guests in Hansard? It Can I just seek some clarification from the member? Does the member want those names included right now in this chronological order in Hansard, or would she prefer that those names be added? No. Um, would you like those names attached to the previous introduction? Yes, Madam the Honourable Member for St. John's. Miigwech, Madam Speaker. Uh, just immediately after your introduction of, of them in the House. Is there leave to include those names? Uh, leave has been granted. Petitions. The Honourable Member for River Heights. Uh, Madam Speaker, I wish to present the following petition to the Manitoba Legislature. The background to this petition is as follows. One, Manitoba elders and seniors have built this province and should receive a high level of support, having earned the right to be treated with due respect, dignity, understanding, and compassion as a fundamental human right. Se two, seniors who reside in personal care homes have more diverse and complex physical and brain health issues today than those who were in similar homes even just five years ago. Yet the staffing formula or minimal personnel requirement is over 20 years old. The issue of the changes to and more complex nature of care is being exacerbated by the provincial government policy of discharging people out of hospitals more quickly, leaving many residents still in need of a high level of care. Four, Manitoba does not have enough health care aides and nurses specifically trained to care for seniors with high and complex level of physical and mental issues, such as those with dementia coupled with multiple chronic conditions. Five. The added complexity of care with such residents is putting additional stress on doctors and family members, as it may take six to eight weeks for a doctor to see a resident in a personal care home. Six, unfortunately, the lack of quality care received by many residents is not unique, causing one person to say that it was easier to watch my dad die in the personal care home than to watch him live in the personal care home. Seven. Staff are so overworked that they are forced to tell senior elders and residents in need, go in your diaper, or I can't help you, or you will get food eventually. Relatives are also being told that residents in care homes should not ever expect to walk again after hip or knee replacement surgery because care homes are not set up for rehabilitation. Nine. The provincial government has allowed personal care homes to serve food that is warmed from frozen, instead of being freshly cooked, depriving seniors the taste of good food, which is one of the few real pleasures that would be able to enjoy at this time of life. Although residents enter personal care homes to have the best possible quality of life in their last few days, weeks, months, or years, relatives repeatedly hear the words, he came here to die and she came here to die. 
11. Relatives are regularly angry, frustrated, disappointed, and shocked at the care their loved ones now receive in Manitoba's personal care homes. 12. Administrators in personal care homes respond to complaints by stating they need more better trained staff. We petition the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba as follows to urge the provincial government to increase training and staffing requirements for personal care homes in Manitoba to ensure residents receive high quality nutritious food as well as compassionate care. Signed by Dolores Blanchard, Linda Morton, Carol Wilson, and many, many others. In accordance with our Rule 133, bracket 6, when petitions are read, they are deemed to be received by the House. <clears throat> Orders of the day, government business, the Honourable Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, pursuant to Rule 33, bracket 7, I'm announcing that the private member's resolution to be considered on the next Tuesday of private member's business will be the one put forward by the Honourable Member for Dauphin. The title of the resolution is removing education tax from property. It has been announced that pursuant to Rule 33, bracket 7, the private member's resolution to be considered on the next Tuesday of private member's business will be one put forward by the Honourable Member for Dauphin. The title of the resolution is removing education tax from property. The Honourable Government House Leader. Thank you again, uh, Madam Speaker. Could you please resume debate on the throne speech? Resuming debate on the motion of the Honourable Member for Southdale and the amendment and sub-amendment thereto, standing in the name of the Honourable Member for Concordia, who has four minutes remaining. Is there leave for the bill to remain standing in the name of the Honourable? Oh, is there leave for the motion to st stand in the name of the Honourable Member for... Concordia. Leave has been denied. Is there somebody that wishes to stand in debate? Yes, great. The Honorable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise and speak to the throne speech uh, this afternoon. Uh, a great day in Winnipeg. As, uh, thousands of uh, Winnipeggers, I understand, uh, were downtown to celebrate the uh, victory of the uh, Blue Bombers, uh, first time in 29 years. And I know there's been uh, celebrations uh, both in this House and last week leading up to the Great Cup. I had the fortune of to be in Calgary uh, to watch the game on uh, on Sunday with my uh, wife Kim and my uh, my son Malachi, and we just had a tremendous time, uh, of course, uh, watching uh, our uh, our home team uh, not only win the Great Cup but uh, dominate uh, the um, the uh, the opposition, which I think was uh, welcomed uh, to see. Um, we. Uh, we were quite nervous about what the outcome uh, might be, at least my, myself and my son, where my wife was quite confident, as she, as she usually is, uh, in the Blue Bombers, but I was fairly nervous, and it was great to see them uh, from the beginning of the game to the end completely dominate the Hamilton Tiger Cats. It was also great to see, I would, I would estimate uh, thousands, maybe 10,000 fans, Winnipeg fans, who uh, made the trip out to, uh, out to Calgary to celebrate together with the... Uh, with the Bombers. Uh, we left McMahon Stadium probably only at around uh, 11 o'clock at night, uh, long after the game had ended. Uh, they finally had to kick us out of the, of the stadium, and I'm not as young as I was when the Bombers won in, uh, in 1990, and I wouldn't want to say we partied like it was 1990, but uh, certainly we had uh, a good time and were well received by those in Calgary. I'd also mention, I know, because there's a lot of concern about um, uh, anxiety in Canada and some of the tensions that exist in different regions of Canada, and that, that, those are real, and uh, I wouldn't want to diminish or, or dismiss that. But it was great to see Canadians from coast to coast to coast come together uh, in Calgary and to, to celebrate, uh, of course, the game of football, but really to celebrate Canada. And the, the day before the Cup at the Stampede Grounds, to be able to walk around and see thousands of Canadians uh, from all parts of our country representing um, they're, they're different football teams, uh, many of which, of course, weren't playing in the Great Cup. And to be able to see them come together as Canadians, and it was a reminder to us that even though we have differences, 
uh, as, uh, as Canadians at times, we have far more in common than we have uh, that separates us. And so it was wonderful to see the unifying power of sport that often happens. Uh, of course, that is never more true than in Winnipeg today, but I think it's true across Canada as well. So it was a great uh, demonstration of, uh, of tremendous support for uh, our team, but really for the game and for Canada uh, overall. And so that was, uh, that was a tremendous thing to see. Uh, Madam Speaker, I, uh, I wanted to say a few words uh, about um, uh, about my constituency, having the opportunity now to speak to the uh, throne speech and the uh, the opportunity to be re-elected as the MLA for Steinbeck. Of course, I'm very pleased to be uh, the Education Minister, um, but I always say during the election, I only run for one job, and that is to be the MLA. Uh, that's the only job that any of us are applying for when we are running for election in uh, any given election. So I'm very honored to be re-elected as the MLA for, for Steinbach for the um, uh, fourth time, uh, or maybe fifth time, I believe. It's been uh, a few times. They were elected in 2003, 2007, 2000. On 11 and again in 2016, so for the fourth time, and uh, I never take for granted the support that we have within uh, within the community uh, and the area that I represent. Uh, even though it's changed tremendously since I first started to represent it in 2003, we've had so many uh, new Canadians come to our country and settle in the Steinbach area, uh, from the Philippines, of course, like many areas of Manitoba, uh, from India, of course, historically from Germany. Uh, and I believe it's one of the most multicultural communities outside of the city of Winnipeg. And that's not always well recognized by those who don't live in the community or maybe haven't visited it for many years. Uh, there might be a certain perception of the community, but it's tremendously multicultural. I often like to say that when I was growing up in the city of Steinbeck, if I wanted to see the world, I had to get on a plane and see the world. But now the world has come to Steinbeck. And that has really been, for my family, and I think for my son in particular, been a great benefit for him. Uh, as, uh, as he's been able to learn and to experience uh, uh, the world without really having to leave the community. And so many of his friends in his school come from different parts of the world. He's been able to lean, learn their traditions uh, and learn about their home countries, and that's been a very uh, great benefit for him. His experience growing up in Steinbach, uh, even though I'm very proud of it and very, very pleased to have uh, lived and grown up in Steinbeck. His experience is richer than mine was, and I suspect that generationally, uh, the next generation will be even richer as well. So I think this is a tremendous benefit. But I very much appreciate the support of all those in the community uh, who offered their support to me and to my family, uh, as they often do. I know that all of us are tremendously proud of our own constituencies. All of us would probably stand up and say that we represent the best constituency in Manitoba, though in my case it's true. Uh, Madam Speaker, and I uh, very much uh, never take for granted when there are those who will um, offer their support, but offer their prayers, offer their uh, personal encouragement to uh, myself, but in particular to my wife and to my son. My son is 13 now, and so he has grown up in, in politics and in political life, and in many ways he is uh, as much of a public personality as I am in my community, and that's, that's uh, different for a young person to grow up in. Uh, there are far more people that know him than he knows, uh, and that's a unique uh, experience. Uh, not a bad experience, but a unique experience, and I'm always very appreciative of the fact that within the community, people are um, supportive of him and, uh, and are very encouraging to him uh, and often engage with him, whether we're at the grocery store or wherever. I know that that's uh, part of uh, who he's becoming as, uh, as a young man as he's just turned 13 years old. My, uh, my wife, Kim, is, uh, uh, and we, those of us who benefit from uh, spouses who are very supportive of us in, in politics, uh, has always been incredibly supportive uh, in this. She attends many events, not as many as perhaps before my son was born, but attends a tremendous amount of events uh, with me. Uh, which I, I think is, is wonderful. It helps us stay connected as a family. Uh, and it may not always be individual time or what people might quali qualify as quality time, um, but I think that that time, even at events, is very important uh, as you stay connected together uh, as a family. And so uh, I'm uh, very, very thankful for the fact that I've been able to represent a constituency where family is important, where they value the fact that we're together uh, as a family, where they are supportive of the fact that we're together as a family, that they're understanding. Uh, and many of the times, particularly in the last five to six years, haven't been as home uh, as much as uh, any of us would, would like. And I'm sure that there are many in elected life who have that same experience where they're not home as often as they would like. 
Um, and when we're not home, when we're either doing our ministerial duties or MLA duties outside of our home communities, to be able to have the support of friends and neighbors and others to be able to offer that uh, support, whether it's just our neighbor, uh, Mr. Penner, uh, John Penner, who always clears our driveway in the winter. I know I don't have to worry about it if I'm not home uh, for, the, for the, that week. And it's, uh, it's really quite something to know that there is somebody there who is uh, supporting and helping your family even when you can't physically be there uh, to do that. And so I very much appreciate uh, that fact. I'm very proud of this government, uh, Madam Speaker, and our Premier, and all of the, uh, those who are part of the caucus uh, who are taking on some difficult challenges. Um, I spent many years on the opposition uh, benches, probably longer than people should spend in opposition, uh, and, um, but wanted to be within government and to see the, uh, um, to take on some of the difficult challenges that uh, we believe needed to be taken on. And I'm very proud of a government that has not shied away from those difficult decisions. It would be easy to sort of operate a government on cruise control and to try to not uh, ever ruffle any feathers and just to try to maintain government. And I would argue that the former NDP government, whether that was under Gary Dewar or uh, in the last few years under Greg Selinger, that essentially was their mantra. They simply did wanted to try to continue to operate government and not rock the boat. Of course, they rocked the boat internally. But in terms of the policy within the province, I think that their expectation was to try to not uh, do anything that would in any way cause any sort of, um, of any sort of controversy. But the reality is in government that if you want to achieve things and if you want to get things done, sometimes you have to make difficult decisions. And this has been a government uh, that has taken on many, many difficult challenges and continues to, to face those challenges uh, directly and head on. Uh, but to do so in a balanced way. So we've continued to see more uh, funding go into uh, health care, record funding, more funding into education, more funding into uh, families, into social services. That is important, but, but not ignoring those other challenges that simply need to be addressed, not the least of which was the deficit that continued to spiral out of control and to grow and add to our debt under the former NDP government, uh, Madam Speaker. There are Manitobans who continue each and every year uh, to see that debt grow as the deficit grew and wondered how it was and if we ever could get back into a place of balance. That was certainly within my constituency one of the key issues that people would say, how are we ever going to get the finances back in order? And then how can you do it in a responsible way? And I think that this Premier and this government has taken that uh, task on and has been able to find that right balance, uh, Madam Speaker. Balance in terms of investing in those areas, uh, those social services, those uh, departments that provide direct services to individuals to continue to provide more support there while on the other hand getting the deficit out of control. And while that, why that is important is because we need to look at those who are going to inherit uh, this great province and to ensure that they have the economic wherewithal as a, as a government entity to be able to invest in those things going forward. As we continue to grow the deficit and the debt, that was becoming uh, at risk, Madam Speaker. So there is uh, more work to do. There is more uh, work to ensure that uh, financial responsibility is there, Mr. Acting Speaker. Um, and uh, I'm confident that this is a government that is willing to continue to take on those difficult tasks and those important tasks, Mr. Uh, Mr. Acting Speaker. And so I uh, appreciate the opportunity to serve in this uh, government. Most particularly, I appreciate the opportunity to be uh, elected as the MLA for the Steinbeck constituency. And most directly, most heartfeltly, I appreciate uh, that I have uh, such a wonderful family who has supported me along in, uh, in this journey. And, uh, and I look forward to seeing the other great things that this government will continue to do in this renewed mandate that have been given to them, uh, given to us by the uh, people of Manitoba and the province of Manitoba. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Acting Speaker, for the opportunity to put a few words on the record regarding uh, the throne speech. And I look forward to all the members of this House supporting uh, the throne speech and future initiatives of the government. The Honourable Member for Notre Dame. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To begin, I'd like to thank the constituents of Notre Dame for electing me on September 10, 2019 to be their member of the Legislative Assembly. The election campaign was a short, intense and rewarding experience. My team and I did our best to meet and meaningfully connect with as many neighbours as we could. 
We covered all 32 polls at least once, some twice, and some three times. I'm proud to say that we won each and every poll, and it was a very convincing win that way. Our campaign volunteers were made up of new friends and old friends, and what most campaigns spend on Canada Post mailers to distribute campaign flyers, we spent on groceries, gas, trays of pancet lumpia, and Costco rotisserie chickens. We had volunteer cooks who would make giant stock pots full of sopas, sotanghon, and lugao to feed our canvassers and sign crews, most of whom would directly come after work and on weekends. Our volunteers hand-delivered each piece of campaign literature to 20,000 folks and to all of the volunteers and donors who came to help whenever and however they could, I thank them most sincerely. I can never repay them for their commitment to me, to the Manitoba New Democratic Party, and to the neighbourhoods and constituents that I now humbly serve. There's a Filipino saying regarding how I view this debt of gratitude. Marunong tumanaw po ako ng utang ng loob. Utang na loob roughly translates to a debt of your inner self. Basically, it refers to how you should never forget what people have done to help you along your way. The help that volunteers offered our campaign is something so valuable that I feel this debt deep in my bones. And the only way I can endeavor to repay our campaign volunteers is by doing my utmost best each and every day to serve our community and this province for the time that I will be granted as an MLA. After getting elected, I can confidently say that my constituency staff and I hit the ground running. The very next day after the election, we opened the doors to our constituency office. Even with the garbage still on the floor from the previous night's election win celebration, we opened the office. We opened the office right away, not because we are gluttons for punishment, but because simply there is such a great need for our services. We are open from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. every Monday to Friday, and we are currently considering adding Saturday appointments too in the future because of the amount of constituency casework our office sees on a daily basis. We get phone calls, emails, social media queries, and plenty of daily walk-ins. What our, our, what our office sees in one day of casework is what I imagine some constituency offices see in two weeks or more. I used to volunteer at the then St. Norbert constituency office when I was a student at the University of Manitoba, and the only person that would come in to see us was the Greek-Canadian actor Nia Vardalos' father because he owned the little strip mall that we were in. And he would come in to say hi, not because he needed any constituency help. Even during this past election campaign, amidst grueling days and nights of door-to-door -door and telephone canvassing, hand-delivering leaflets and putting up lawn signs, our campaign office volunteers were actually doing casework, like reviewing Manitoba Provincial nominee program applications, trying to link homeless folks with housing, and accompanying folks to access legal aid and other government services. Our volunteer campaign manager, Nick Higgins, said he's never seen a campaign like it. Nick drew the line on election day, saying, no casework on E-Day. But the very next day after the election, my dedicated and knowledgeable constituency staff were back to work, officially serving the community. Within two months of taking office, our constituency executive already planned and executed a successful fundraiser for the NDP. In October, constituency staff, volunteers, and I also attended MEP and Community Train the Trainer workshops, sponsored by the Social Planning Council of Winnipeg and the Menno Simmons College Department of Conflict Resolution Studies. To this end, our staff and volunteers will be hosting a series of meth and community workshops for our neighborhoods in the coming new year. This month of November, our constituency volunteers mark the beginning of our Saturday free gym at a community high school. And every Saturday throughout this upcoming school year, we offer free recreation services, including basketball clinics for kids and a rotation of volleyball, basketball, Zumba classes, and chess tournaments. This coming winter, we are also planning to use the Saturday free gym spaces for our upcoming Lunch and Learns 
on topics like diabetes awareness and climate change. This coming spring will mark our annual free tax prep services and our constituency's annual job fair, both were the efforts that my mother initiated and built up over her years in office. For this year's coming job fair, we will be making a special effort to focus on youth hiring opportunities. Also on our current to-do list is early planning for this coming Canada Day. Our constituency executive has partnered with the West Alexander's Residents Association, who has applied for federal Celebrate Canada grants to be able to put on a significant Canada Day experience for families, especially kids in our neighbourhoods. I'm also very proud of the work that my constituency is currently doing with Strini Reddy, the former superintendent of schools of the Frontier School Division. Together, we are working on obtaining partnerships with grocers like Seafood City, Costco, and No Frills, in conjunction with Perimeter Airlines, to be able to provide free, fresh fruits to kids in northern communities on a regular basis. All of this coordinated activity is what I meant by my constituency team and I hitting the ground running after the election. Getting elected to be an MLA is one of the highest privileges that can be bestowed upon someone, and how I plan to give humble thanks to those who elected me and supported me is by working hard to lead by example, being, responsible, being responsive to the needs of people, learning from the community, and working with community to make each and every day count for the next four years. At this time, I would like to take this opportunity to thank and highlight my constituency staff. Jean Padrinao, Ray Sangalang, and Beth Campomanes. Jean Padrinao has served as Logan CA for 10 years and has graciously agreed to stay on to help me learn the ropes. Tita Jean is a technology whiz, an expert at keeping on top of all the changes of the immigration file and how it relates to everyday applicants and their families. She's in charge of my busy calendar and has a wealth of institutional knowledge and experience that I rely on daily. Tita Jean devotes devotes countless hours of volunteer service to the music ministry in her church and has a sense of purpose, focus, and priorities that are guided by her unwavering faith in God. Ray Sangalang currently serves our constituency office as an outreach coordinator. Peter Ray was a seminarian, a priest in training as a youth, and later became an advertising and market research executive for a multinational company. This unique combination of ex-priest and retired marketing executive is actually perfect for politics because of the compassion and insight he has for constituents and his ability to strategize and capitalize on political opportunities and outcomes. Beth Campomanes has both formal law and legal assistant training, and she currently handles a lot of complex constituency work. Ate Beth is extremely patient, intelligent, and brings a joyfulness and energy to the place that reminds me of my mother, someone we all respect very much. Because of these three extremely gifted and hardworking people, by God's grace, I will succeed as an MLA and be able to serve my constituency and this province to the best of my ability. Thank you, Tita Jean, Tita Ray, and Atebev. <laughs> Notre Dame is a new constituency name for the Winnipeg neighborhoods that line the Notre Dame Avenue from Isabel Street all the way to the Red River College area past King Edward Avenue. The north-south boundaries of the constituency are from the train tracks just above Logan Avenue to Sargent Avenue. The neighborhoods I serve include Brooklands and Weston, where I grew up and where my family currently owns a small home, West Alexander, Centennial, and the West End. There are 12 schools, including Techbach High School and Daniel McIntyre. The communities that I serve are solidly made up of the working class and the working poor. As the principal of Cecil Rhodes, my old school, put it recently during a visit, she said, we have no rich families in our school. 
Everyone is working to get by, and some families are facing varying levels of poverty, some even worse than what we can see. This characterization could be used to describe major components of the larger constituency as a whole. We are still working on getting the numbers to get a more accurate view of the social and economic makeup of this new constituency. But when I filed my nomination papers with the Elections Manitoba Returning Officer Janice Behrens, she told me that Notre Dame is the second poorest constituency in all of Canada. I said to Ms. Behrens, do you mean the second poorest in all of Manitoba? And she said, no, all of Canada. The first poorest is in northern Quebec. Another long-standing fact that keeps me awake some nights is a statistic on child poverty that relates to our constituency. Almost 50% of kids live in poverty in the federal riding of Winnipeg Centre. And since all of Notre Dame is part of Winnipeg Centre, that means one in two of our kids do not have proper access to food, clothing, and shelter. This is a harsh reality that our families and our children have endured for far too long. This year in particular has been a very difficult year for our constituency due to the proliferation of meth use and substance abuse in our communities. There have been numerous property thefts, home invasion, and violent crimes in our neighborhoods. Stores are closing because of rampant thefts. Schools have now taken to locking all their doors during school hours to protect students and staff from serious incidents. Prior to taking this drastic step, one junior high school had called 911 10 times in a span of one and a half months and even had one lockdown incident. One principal told me that the daily pickup of drug syringes in their very small playground nets about 25 needles every single morning. We have had two separate incidents months apart where a teacher was assaulted and a parent dropping off their child at 9 a.m. in the morning was also assaulted for their belongings. Many residents are feeling frustrated and some even fearful of what they are seeing around them. During the run-up to the election, after I had won the NDP nomination to represent Notre Dame, I met a proud, lifelong resident of Weston, Ron Keller, a consciously nonpartisan community leader who has done incredible work with organizing housing co-ops in Weston. Over the past decade, Mr. Keller has been a board member of the Norwest Health Co-op, as well as a seniors advocate. Mr. Keller toured us in his van and showed us each community centre and each housing co-op and the history and activities and offerings of each place. And for fun, because he knows I'm a little partial to the NDP, he brought us to an industrial area near the Logan area railway tracks where he said back when he was a boy, there used to be an opening to a short tunnel where all the railway workers from Westlands and Brooklands used to go in and out to get to the rail yards for work. At the mouth of this tunnel, he said, was where Stanley Knowles would at 5 a.m. stand and greet the workers, hand out leaflets to go to this or that community gathering later, to hear speeches, and more importantly, to organize. Maybe not coincidentally, Andrew Swan, long-serving, well-loved MLA from Minto, on the very same day, also gave me a framed picture of Stanley Knowles that hung in his constituency office for the past 16 years. Mr. Keller's story and Andrew's precious gift to me was just a reminder that the struggle for equality, social justice, human dignity, for a living wage, for workers' rights, for women's rights, for indigenous rights, for human rights, this struggle has been going on for a long time. I've been blessed to have many <coughs> teachers and allies in this struggle and now have many committed NDP members and now fellow caucus members that are here with me in this struggle for a better world. As part of the NDP caucus, I've been given the mandate of status of women critic, immigration critic, and I'm also a member of the French critic. Monsieur le Président, je suis fière de faire partie du caucus en français. Je suis actuellement des coups afin d'améliorer mes compétences en français. En tant que membre du caucus, je soutiens notre critique des affaires francophones, Adrien Sala, en assistant à de nombreuses rencontres avec la communauté francophone. Je souhaite être à l'écoute de leurs besoins et de les soutenir. Il est essentiel pour moi de montrer ma reconnaissance à l'un des peuples fondateurs du Manitoba, à son histoire, à sa culture et à ses droits légitimes et légaux. De plus, je souhaite montrer mon respect aux nombreuses communautés rurales francophones et à l'ensemble des francophones. 
qu'il soit présent depuis des générations ou qu'il vient d'arriver dans notre jolie province. J'aimerais remercier mes jeunes amis Zachary C. 10 ans et sa petite sœur Trinity C. 8 ans qui gentiment FaceTime en français avec moi pendant 10 minutes chaque jour. Mr. Speaker, in my role as Status of Women critic, my family and I drove to Flin Flon and the Pa two weekends ago to join with women and their very young families who are protesting the one-year temporary closure of the maternity ward at the Flin Flon General Hospital. Heavily pregnant women in Flin Flon are forced to travel long and sometimes treacherous distances to hospitals in the Pa or Dauphin or Winnipeg in order to give birth. Mom and baby are then discharged after as little as five hours post-delivery to make room for other moms about to give birth. Babies are being discharged without getting their 24-hour required blood work. Due to this government's health care cuts and closures, pregnant women in the North are regularly encouraged to voluntarily induce labor at 37 weeks, even though a pregnancy is considered full-term at 40 weeks. When I gave birth two years ago, my obstetrician told me that we wouldn't even consider inducing my baby until after 41 weeks. Northern women and their newborns are not receiving the care that they need. All pregnant women across this province deserve birth delivery services that are safe and close to home. On the immigration file, my first round of visits with folks who work in immigrant settlement services have asked me to advocate for changes to reinstate Manitoba health card access to newcomers to and to international students. They have asked me to advocate for more resources to combat fraud in the MPNP system, and they have asked to address the funding cuts to adult education and to affordable housing supports. We know that new immigrants generate a net economic growth of about $300 million per year to this province, and that new immigrants from the nominee program are largely responsible for the population increases we experience in Manitoba. Despite the economic and population advantages that we bring to this province, the throne speech was completely silent on this fact and makes no priority of helping newcomers succeed further in contributing to our province through increasing funding for adult education, childcare, and housing. This government has made no new housing commitments and has in fact sold off 300 plus units to the private sector. In closing, I would like to give special thanks to my family, friends, and my beloved parents, Orly and Floor, and especially to my husband, Joel. Thank you for all your support and love. Merci, Monsieur le Président. The Honourable Member for Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to acknowledge that we are on Treaty 1 territory, home to land, the Métis. I would also like to acknowledge that I reside in Treaty 5 territory and my constituency rely lines within the traditional land of Nisuatra Cree Nation, the Tascuat Cree Nation, War Lake Cree Nation, Fox Lake Cree Nation, and York Factory Cree Nation. I would like to thank the voters of Churchill, Fox Lake, Gillam, Piquitine, War Lake, Ilfred, York Landing, Split Lake, Nelson House, Thompson, Woboden, and Thicket Portage for electing me as a representative in the legislature. I am proud to come from the North. I am proud to have many strong women leaders in my region, like Councillor Jackie Walker and Vice Chief Cheryl Moore Hunter from Nisuatarek. Chief Betsy Kennedy from War Lake, who is the longest serving female chief in Manitoba, and Member of Parliament Nikki Ashton. I'd like to congratulate my fellow MLAs on their election, and I look forward to being a strong voice in my constituency. As members of the Legislative Assembly, we are leaders, and our role is to be the voice of our constituents and ensure our constituents' interests are being brought forward in the House and considered in every piece of legislation we debate. I want to thank everyone who got me here today. My victory was made possible by many people coming together for a common goal and bringing back representation for the North. In particular, I'd like to thank my campaign manager, Blair Hudson, who worked tirelessly to ensure we had a winning campaign. 
Words cannot describe how much I appreciate Blair and thank him for all of his dedication and hard work. I'd like to thank my voter contact person, Jody Levy, who was always a cheery face in the campaign office. I'd like to thank the team that traveled with me, Ross Martin, Pam Chrysler Martin, Dana, Alan Dale, Rod Murphy, John Heath, and Jim Brandt. I'd also like to give a special thanks to my son, Nicholas Morris, who traveled by train with us to Churchill. They allowed me to speak to people in every community in the constituency. It was really important to me that we went to all the communities to listen, to hear from them what the local issues are. My sign guy, Wayne Levesque, was crucial in ensuring all of our signs went up every day. I'd also like to thank everybody else who made this possible. I'd like to thank my family, my husband, William Morris, who encourages and believes in me, my two sons, who inspire and drive me to help make Manitoba the best province it can be. I want all children to be able to be their best, best selves. I'd also like to thank leaders in the communities for their support, especially City Councilor and Deputy Mayor Les Ellsworth for all the door knocking advice and support. I'd also like to thank former MLA Steve Ashton for his encouragement and faith in me. It means a lot. He has shown me the importance of visiting, staying connected to the communities and listening. I'd also like to thank MP Nikki Ashton for her support and encouragement. She has shown me the importance of staying true to who you are. I'd like to share my story and what motivates me to do the work in activism. My mother was a single mother of two small children when my brother was a year and a half and I was three years old. She wanted to provide my brother and I with a good life but didn't know where to start. So she went back to school and started upgrading her education. She was able to do this while on assistance. And there were, that's where the seeds of activism started for her. She saw how her privilege made it easier to access programs and how support workers would bend over backwards to make sure she had access to all of the support, supports available. This did not sit right with her. So she found, as she found out about the programs, she made sure other people knew about them and helped them gain access to the program, whether it be through informing or helping them fill out the paperwork to gain access. My mom saw again how her privilege helped her in the family court system. Once again, support workers made sure my family had access to all programs. Seeing how the system worked really upset her and drove her to do something about it. The, inadequate, the inequities helped her decide to go into law with a focus on <coughs> public practice to make sure everybody had equitable access to the system. Her activism didn't stop there. She fought hard for LGBTQ2S, women, immigrants, and indigenous rights. As we are doing her activism, as she was doing her activism, my brother and I were there learning why these fights are important. I was shown from a strong, I was shown from an early age that if something isn't right and people aren't being treated fairly just because of who they are, you have a duty to stand up and help fight, fight to change it. These early lessons shaped who I was and have become, helped me become the adult and the parent I am today. As I started my work as an adult, I knew I wanted to do something where I can make a difference in people's lives and I knew I wanted to help fight the injustices that happen every day. I found that work with my member of parliament, Nikki Ashton. I am proud to have worked with her for 10 years. Working with the member, for, the member of parliament for 10 years, I saw firsthand how, ser how services and funding cuts can make a difference in people's lives. I, I did casework outreach and I've seen firsthand what lives are like up in the north. I'm a northerner, an activist, and a proud socialist. Being from the north has shown me the importance of fighting, not just for yourself, but for your neighbors, because when one succeeds, we all succeed. I believe that the leadership has to be grounded in the reality of the communities you represent. If you know, you, if you know what your community needs, you are, going to, you are going to be important on your own basis. Meeting with community members directly, I know that what the community actually needs, and that is why I am committed to going to communities in between elections. I'm a mother of two wonderful boys who are full of life, and being a working mother has shown me the need for quality, affordable childcare. 
Childcare is important to society because we can't talk jobs, training, and education or the economy without a focus on childcare. Countries that put, pr put a priority on child quality, affordable childcare have some of the best outcomes for children and the families. They have the highest participation of women in the workforce and have the highest standard of living. I am proud to come from a province that has been a leader on the child care. And, and in fact, some provinces like BC are looking to Manitoba to set their child care policies. I am worried that, these that this will change under the current government since they have frozen funding, funding levels to 2016. And there is no indication that that is going to change. What this government does not understand is for every dollar spent on childcare is not a dollar spent in the local economy. My oldest is turning 11 and I am so happy he had access to an all day kindergarten program at the school district of Mystery Lake offered, but they had to cut the program because of the cuts to education made by this government. My son and other children who started kindergarten in 2013 are the only ones who have been benefited from the 20 kid cap. I want to see all children have access to the best education so they have the skills they need to be the best they can be. The PC government ignored teachers and ignored research that says kids benefit from small class size and remove this. I saw firsthand the importance of small class size. I believe that the government, I believe that the government should be looking to what is in the best interest of children and listening to teachers on the ground. And the importance of small class size. Leaders in educational fields say that small class size make a difference. Being an activist is also part of who I am. I was shown from an early age that if you can make a difference, you have to. Because when everybody helps out, communities and organizations can be the best that they can be. Because of that, I've joined different boards in my communities, including the Thompson YWCA, doing advocacy work and focusing on women's issues. And I've also joined the Thompson Ski Club where I take my children every Sunday, Sunday afternoons in the winter. I'm a proud socialist. I believe that governments need to be leaders. I believe no one should be punished for being poor. I believe housing, food, healthcare, and education are human rights and should be treated as such. For example, ensuring Manitobans have access to quality pharmacare means that they do not have to choose between medication and rent. This will save time and money in the, both in the emergency rooms and it will save lives. Government sets the tone with the relationships with Indigenous people as well. Government should be modeling what true, meaningful reconciliation means by recognizing in both Indigenous and Métis inherent rights. As the MLA for Thompson, I will advocate for our region. We need governments to care about Northerners, not just co corporations that exploit our land and our people. We need to invest in infrastructure and improve Highway 6, 290 and 391. The cuts to public transportation need to be reversed. That has meant that smaller communities had to make hard choices when it came to public transportation. We need investments in education, including capital money for new schools in northern Manitoba. In the community of Gillam, they've been having a portable for the last 40 years. In my, in my home community of Thompson, the school, local elementary school, Wapanuck, is looking at adding on its second portable. Schools in the north are aging and funding is needs for much needed renovation. I promise to continue to stand up for investments and other northern priorities as they become evident. Thank you. With us this afternoon in the speaker's gallery, uh, on, on, sorry, on the loge to my left is, the, uh, is Nancy Allum, the former member for St. Vitale. On behalf of the honourable members, I welcome you here today. The honourable member for Elmwood. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy uh, Speaker. Very pleased to... Uh Very uh, pleased to uh, speak to the throne speech today, and I guess at the beginning I'd like to congratulate the Blue Bombers uh, for their uh, big victory uh, in the Great Cup. It's been, uh, I'm told, 29 years since the last uh, time that we won the Great Cup, and 
I think I've been a season ticket holder since about that time, and uh, it's hard to believe that that amount of time has gone by. We keep hoping for uh, for results each each and every year. I know the member for Steinbeck is also a season ticket holder as well. I do see him at the games uh, regularly, and uh, so we're uh, it was a very big surprise, I guess, and I think there was. Uh, a big celebration today at the Forks. I did see some other MLAs down there uh, having a having a very good time, and I think we the city should enjoy this. The province should enjoy this uh, while we can, because these things don't happen uh, every day. Uh, there'll be a big expectation now. I can hear I can hear some of the fans tonight on the radio talking about how this is going to happen again next year, and I know that sometimes these things don't don't work out. Now, um, you know, at the beginning, I'd like to, to say that I, I remember the um, last throne speech uh, last fall, November 2018, and the, um, the government at that time included in the throne speech um, the, uh, the words that uh, they were going to bring in protections against unsolicited high-pressure sales tax tactics used by direct sellers. This is what they announced last year. And this is the government that, you know, likes to talk uh, um, about uh, promises made and promises kept. I, I've seen that. Somehow, somehow they've got to update that chart because they're missing one. On, on direct sellers, they seem to have, have forgotten about that one completely. And, you know, it is, it is a, a uh, case where um, there are some uh, people that have been seriously taken advantage of by direct sellers. In the last couple of years alone, we've had, I believe it is Alberta and Ontario, ban direct sellers completely, or certainly ban their activities as it relates to the type of activities that uh, some of the direct sellers here at Utility Bill are doing here in Winnipeg. And, uh, and guess what's happened? In the last year since they made the promise to the throne speech, we've gone through the whole year, the election cycle, we've gone through another throne speech, not a mention, not a mention at all about direct sellers. So yesterday I asked the new minister, now what they did was they took consumer affairs and moved it from, from justice over to finance. Now the finance minister probably doesn't even know it's there. So yesterday, I decided uh, to remind him about that, and um, he clearly, in my mind, doesn't know it's there, because he's done absolutely nothing, um, and the government has done absolutely nothing under the previous minister and this minister so far to compensate people who have been taken advantage in the scam. Now, I, I have a, a case in, in Elmwood constituency which is very similar to the one that I asked him about yesterday. Now, yesterday, I asked him about uh, a Winnipeg resident who, whose case was written up by the CBC last year, where a uh, direct seller called Utilibill promised to pay over, uh, was, was promising to pay $37,000. These guys sold a furnace, a HEPA filter, a water filter, an electronic air cleaner for a total of $37,000 to a, a gentleman um, when experts have said that the cost of these items should not be more than $10,000, including equipment and installation. Now, the case of my constituent, it's the same company, Utility Bill, um, who sold the, um, the my uh, constituent a um, series of items, not in the thirty-seven thousand dollar range, but you know sufficient that the um, that my constituents are very upset about this, and all of these people are looking for a compensation. Now, where is the compensation going to come from? Well, in the case of direct sellers, direct sellers have to register with the, with the province, with the government, and they have to obtain a bond. And 
when they get the bond, the reason they get the bond is that if they do things like this and take advantage of, uh, of, of, of people, that there will be compensation made to the, to the people as a result of calling in the bond. And I guess w what my question was to the minister is what has happened with regard to the bond at this point? And I've not been able to get any clear answers from this government about that. I mean, they have, there's a, certainly a limitation uh, under the bond. So if they wait too long, they'll probably miss the opportunity to uh, obtain the funds. And then the question is, how do they go about reimbursing the people uh, who have been taken advantage of? And what are the what kind of deadlines or dates are they using um, in in these cases? Now the new the new cases that keep coming forward, are they going to be included? You know, so we don't know what it is that they are, um, how they how they are are. Um, using the uh, bonding opportunities they have here. We don't know whether they plan to follow Ontario and Alberta and ban the practice. Like, we just got silence over there, and I don't know whether this is just confusion on their part, or they just, this, this issue somehow doesn't seem to, to merit their, their attention. Um, we would like to know what in the world is going on with this government? Like, why make a promise that you have no intention of keeping, right? Make a big issue about promises made, promises kept. You put it in the throne speech. Like, usually when a government goes to the, you know, goes that far, they really think this is a big issue. You know, things don't get in the throne speech unless there is a, uh, a paramount issue involved here and that they intend to do something. So how can they get away with it just like, like, like flavor of the day? Oh, well, let's do the, let's draft up the throne speech. Well, what are we gonna put in it? Well, let's compensate some direct sellers. And that gets them by the throne speech day, last fall, and then they just forget about it, move on. And meanwhile, the victims are out there having taken advantage. They're marauding through the city here and across the province selling inflated uh, appliances. I mean, $37,000, what in the world is going on when you can, when you can be sold $37,000 for uh, $10,000 worth of equipment? Like, where is this government? They're supposed to be protecting the consumers. And they actually come out of their little, sna uh, like a snail, eh, out of their shell. They come out of their shell, they look around, oh, there's a problem. Let's solve it. Let's put in the throne speech. Let's pretend we're going to do something and then do absolutely nothing. You would have been better off just like leaving it alone. Stay in the shell. Don't come out. Just ignore it. Hope it'll go away. Right? Well, it's not going to go away because there's more and more people that are, are contacting us now um, complaining about this company. So I'm going to keep asking, you know, uh, the minister. Maybe they'll move it. You know, the little P, they'll move it around to another minister, uh, you know, in, in the next few months, and somebody else will get to do nothing about it. <laughs> so, you know, once again, I think we have to recognize that the government is, you know, intact halfway through its mandate. And I say that meaning that there's, they're halfway through. They've had their three years, and there'll be a, maybe another three years tops maybe extra if the Premier gets scared and doesn't want to come out and call another three-year election. But, uh, you know, the, 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 the point is that they have, uh, you know, they've taken some chances in their first three years, and it's just amazing to me that they're still standing because what they did to the people of Winnipeg and Manitoba by closing those three ERs is absolutely unbelievable. Unbelievable that they could have gotten away with that. And you know, we were talking about Concordia yesterday, and you know, this is like the third uh, version of Concordia Hospital, but it was started by the by Mennonite community way back, you know, back in the early 1900s. And it initially was set up 
the first hospital was in the West End, actually. And the second one was on, uh, in, in around Scotia Street, around in there. And then it, the big one, you know, opened up where, uh, by, the, uh, by the Louise Bridge. And, um, and then, of course, it was moved in 1974 by Ed Schreier uh, into its current location, where it's been all this time. So it is particularly galling, I'm sure, to all those strong supporters from the community who've supported the Conservatives all these years to have their entire legacy just wiped out by a, a, this government that decided that they don't want to have emergency services in northeast Winnipeg that takes care of the entire area all the way to Transcona, north of the city. When this was set up in the 70s, you know, Ed Schreier set up two hospitals, the Concordia and Seven Oaks. As a matter of fact, if the truth be known, I'm told that those two floors that are part of Seven Oaks right now actually were supposed to be extra floors on Concordia. But uh, Ed decided in his wisdom to lop off a couple floors and move them over into the North End, which was very smart, I think. And, and at a time when, you know, it was understood that communities needed hospitals. You know, how can you possibly take the population and double it and then somehow say, oh, we need less hospitals, right? And, and to use, and to use your, your, the, uh, the uh, uh, so-called expert, I mean, they, what they do is, like, anybody can go and take a, a, a statistical report and say, well, yeah, Calgary is bigger and it has fewer hospitals. But you've got to look at, at more than that. You have to look at what the road system is like. You know, Calgary doesn't have the Louise Bridge, which is about to fall in the river because this government, because this government refuses to do anything about it. You know, the city... They you know they want to talk about my signs and you know something I you know they they just can't Order. stop talking about these signs and the reality is that we have more signs that have big horking NDP on them than we have that don't have them right like why don't you take a drive Order. rather than I just ask a member to respect the member in debate. The Honourable Member for Elmwood. Deputy Chair. Uh, but you know what they do? They just simply Google CBC and see, oh, they did a story on uh, Louise Bridge, and they see a sign there that, that, is, that doesn't have NDP on, and all of a sudden, none of my signs have NDP. Well, drive around. But you don't drive around. Ever since Gary Filman's days, the press always made a big joke about the fact that they'd get on the press bus in the morning and they'd say, well, where are we going? Well, they were going out to uh, Bronx, right, on Henderson Highway. And so the press would figure, well, we should be there in about 10 minutes, right? Half hour later, they're on the perimeter highway. Why are they going on the perimeter highway? Because they don't want to drive down Henderson Highway. As simple as that. And that is, well, I get all riled up when they like to talk about these signs, which is just totally untrue. We had like, now this time around is a little different. We had 1,300 little yellow signs. So it kind of confused them a little bit, right? But they still didn't want to drive down Henderson Highway. They were complaining about how they was cutting off the vision, the traffic, right? There was, they had their own, you know, Tory hacks out there making a fuss about, oh, your sign's too big, your sign's too big, take it down, right? And when you moved it a bit, they wanted them all down. Until then, they started putting up signs. You know, Lawrence Tote, Lawrence Tote started putting up big signs with his picture on there. All of a sudden, everything was fine. You know, it was okay to have those big conservative signs up there, but put up a whole bunch of these little yellow ones. Oh my God, the whole world is coming to an end. But anyway, I'm used to, I'm used to getting this kind of reaction from these folks and only wish the Premier was here because when we talk about the Louise Bridge, the city just finished its consultations on Saturday. Order. Order. Uh, the member shouldn't be referring to the absence of, the, of a member from this house. Pardon me? 
And while I'm up here, I'd just like to ask for a little better decorum and let the member finish his statement. Thank you. Member for Elmwood. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Chair. And my reference to the Premier is that in the past, he likes to talk about this issue. And he likes to talk about the Louise Bridge. And I like to talk about the Louise Bridge, too. So let's talk about the Louise Bridge. <laughs> the City of Winnipeg had its final consultations this weekend. And I went there, and I got to say, these are my first consula- cons- consultations in some 30 years that have actually been happy because they drew, they drew the proposed uh, bridge exactly where it should go. Well, very close to where it should go, but it's close enough. And, and, and so I'm starting to believe once again that it's possible, before this thing collapses into the river, that we're actually going to get it rebuilt. It's the second, you know, Elmwood constituency has the two oldest bridges in Winnipeg, 100-year-old bridges. Louise is not even the oldest bridge. <clears throat> the Redwood Bridge is the oldest. You know, I have two of them. I don't see any of this in Charleswood. I don't see anything in any South, South Winnipeg, all brand new structures out there. And this, and this bridge literally has been so close to getting built. When Sam Cates was the mayor and uh, Thomas Steed was the councillor, you know, all of a sudden things started to happen. And we thought it, was, it went from its low priority, it just scooted right up. It was like number six or four. Well, it went like from number 10 to number six overnight. Thought, my goodness, it's going to get done. Well, it didn't get done. Now it's kind of slipped back again. And so now it's being included in the, in the new uh, proposed uh, transit uh, corridor. And, uh, you know, that too is being massaged a little bit. So things are looking, you know, if that, if that plan... Uh, gets approved in June, the final plan, then I have some hope that it might get done. But at the end of the day, nothing is going to get done until this government commits to it and the federal government commits to it. And I just want to encourage this government to actually, you know, proceed with this issue because this whole, this bridge, you know, it deals with, deals with t- in, in daily like 50,000 uh, cars go through there. Now, the, the new plan, obviously, is not going to replace a two-lane bridge. We're talking about two lanes in 2019, one, e- one each way. That's all it's got. So we're talking about a six-lane bridge now, four for cars and two for buses. So this is a big improvement. And even, you know, the engineering people will tell you that this thing has got bad, the old bridge has bad engineering reports. Literally, nobody knows whether it's going to last very much longer. Now, I don't want to be accused, you know, of having the darn bridge closed down, you know, because of engineering issues, right? So I'd like to see the thing stay open and handle the traffic that it's handling. But, you know, it doesn't give you a lot of confidence when last spring I went over there and the CBC guy was there, there was like big holes in it, right? Like you could actually walk right through, like on the walkway, you could step right through. And when I drive under there in my boat in the summertime, they've got pieces of plywood. I've even put pictures of this in my leaflets that go out. This thing has got all kinds of ply- pieces of plywood screwed up under, under the under side of it, right? Like, you know, when it, if, it, if and when it ever falls apart, right, like the boaters are going to get hit as well as the people that are driving over this thing, right? So, you know, well, the member for Rossmere wants to talk about time, and I know he's made his speech already, so clearly he doesn't, he's not worried about himself getting up uh, to make a speech. Well, I already talked about the bridge. We just want the thing built. The whole Northeast wants it built. And I wanted to say you cannot, you know, make all these assertions about how, how many hospital uh, ERs are required unless you consider all the traffic and the bridges and stuff like that. You can't compare, you know, Calgary's situation to Winnipeg. And that's why I'm, you know, highly critical of the, of the Peachy Report being 100% applicable 
to the situation here in Winnipeg. Anyway, Mr. Uh, Vice or Speaker, Deputy Speaker, I want to thank you very much for the time. The member's time has expired. The Honourable Member for St. Vitel. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I want to say thank you to all the people who helped me get here today. Uh, I'll first start by thanking uh, a very important person in my life. Uh, I couldn't really ask for a better partner and wife, uh, and wife and my wife Shannon, who's here today. She has not only supported our family during the long hours of campaigning, but on many occasions she's actually come out door knocking with us as well, including actually on our anniversary this summer. She has taken more on more than her fair share of caring for our two children. Shannon is, is uh, both a talented musician and music educator. After earning her master's degree in music performance, she uh, played for two seasons at the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra. Then, finding her passion in music education, she went back to school and got her education degree. She's currently an incredible elementary music teacher. I'm not only grateful that she's chosen to support me in this way, uh, but I'm so grateful that she does it with such grace. Uh, thank you for being my partner in life's adventure and for being the rock of our household. Uh, she's here. If I ask the members to maybe provide uh, a little round of applause for my wife as well. Thank you to my parents, Merle and Garnet Moses, who are also here today, and my in-laws, Joan and Fraser Linklater. Uh, they have all supported me for as long as I can remember. They have been my biggest backers inside and outside of politics. My father is a retired civil engineer who's worked for both the provincial and federal governments. My mother is a retired health care service provider. Joan and Fraser Linklater are both retired musicians and music educators who spent the better part of the last two decades teaching students at the University of Manitoba. I thank them all sincerely for helping me become the person that I am today. So thank you. There you I really do consider myself lucky to have family to support me and a family that is, is, has such a diverse and cultural background. They've chosen to live around the globe, my family. There are many races, and they're, they're black, they're white. I have family members who are from indigenous backgrounds who live in North America, South America, Europe, Africa, Asia. And this multiculturalism is part of who I am and a part, and I'm proud to see that this multiculturalism is also finally becoming evident, more evident in this chamber as well. I want to thank as well, Mr. Deputy Speaker, as was announced earlier, uh, we have former MLA Ms. Nancy Allen here today with us, and I want to thank her. The first time I met Nancy, I was impressed with her energy and the way she captured a room of people. She was able to engage so many people and bring them together. As I got to know Nancy more, I quickly learned that some of her best qualities are how formidable and fierce she is. She is wonderfully competitive in the best way. Nancy was able to use all of these skills to work hard and find ways to benefit our community of St. Vital. Ultimately, her passion for the people around her and her, for her community are what made her a great MLA. I'm so grateful to count her as a friend and to count Nancy as one of my mentors. And I truly hope that I can emulate her dedication to St. Vital. So thank you. I do want to take some time to thank other volunteers that I have had on my campaign. These people are dedicated, have dedicated hours and hours of their time to my successful campaign. I'll thank Mike Baraz, our campaign manager, Monica Girard, our official agent, Devin Kelly, coordinating our volunteers. And there are so many volunteers, but just to name a few, briefly, 
I'll just make a list of names here that I want to thank Brian, Chris, Ellen, Neil, Natalie, Ryan, Riley, Amber, Ross, Akalia, Andrew, Liz, Frank, Irene, Grant, Claire, Kevin, Joan, Andrew, plus Sarah and Matt helping us coordinate our E-Day. So just a snippet of a few of the volunteers who really made our election success possible. There's so many volunteers and unfortunately I'm not able to name all of them. The people in this chamber today know that it takes a small army to really be successful in a campaign. Those are just a few of the people in my small army and I do want to voice my sincere, sincere and heartfelt thanks to each and every one of them. I also want to thank the central office and the central campaign staff and volunteers there that work day and night to help each candidate out, including myself. I want to say thank you to our leader, Wab Canoe, who came out and helped our leader. Order. We have to refer to uh, members in this house by their constituency and not by their name. The Honourable Member for St. Vital. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I apologize, and I'd like to uh, thank in my speech the leader of the official opposition, who came door knocking with me in St. Vital to find out firsthand about the issues of, that the people of St. Vital face. And I remember him joining me and knocking doors along Kingston Crescent. That evening, I went into a house and visited a neighbor, that, uh, a house that was backing onto the Red River, and chatted with them about the issues that they were facing. We spoke about um, we spoke about the best ways that we can simply fix our health care issues. Facing three emergency room closures in the city of Winnipeg, we spoke about the options that we would present to fix the crisis. The front door was closed in the house and uh, I could see through the window that, while, that our lead, leader of the official opposition was approaching. <laughs> and what I did is I opened the door for him to enter the home so that we could together discuss and discuss the issues about health care and about how to simply fix our environment for today, make some progress today, but also fix it for our future generations. This time was so important to the couple that we were both able to take time out and speak to them directly about the issues. That the couple ended their conversation by saying, you know, they weren't sure before, but now, We've spoken about the issues and that we could count on their vote. Now, we were walking away from the home down the front steps uh, to have uh, Nancy Allen and one of uh, some others of our, of our volunteers chatting with their next door neighbor who happily proclaimed out that they were excited to take one of our lawn signs. And at that moment, that same couple that we spoke to opened back up their front door and said, hey, we want a lawn sign too for our front lawn. And it was simply a great moment to see people really buy into our plan for fixing health care, for working and improving our education system, and making sure that our environment was clean for future generations. I also want to say thank you to those who made financial contributions to our campaign. From the smallest to the largest amount, every single donation mattered, and it helped to push us over the top. I thank those people who took lawn signs, who helped us out in any way they could, small or large, even those who supported us online. Those people were the wind in our sails. They were the motivation for us pushing hard right to the end of every single day. To the voters of St. Vital, I say thank you. Thank you to those who opened the doors to us to talk to me, talk to my volunteers. Thank you for sharing your issues and your concerns with me. Thank you for sharing your hopes and aspirations with me as well. I remember, in fact, one man who opened the door for me while canvassing. And before I could say a word, he said, just hold on for a minute. He, he ran down into his home, down to the basement, and brought his two kids up, brought his daughter and his son up to hear what I had to say and what our, my plan was for St. Vital and for the future of Manitoba. Now, I was very fortunate and I feel honoured that the man's daughter, who had just turned eight, 18 earlier this year, decided that she was going to cast her first ever vote 
for me. I'm so happy that that father is teaching his children about the importance of voting and having your voice heard. Having it heard through an election process. But not only that, I am humbled when I consider that I earned the vote of that 18-year-old girl, earned her first ever vote. And I heard, frankly, from dozens of constituents that either just become voting age or had just become citizens and who were casting their first ever vote for me. I'm honored to have reached, to receive each and every one of those, and I will work hard every day because of it. But most importantly, I honestly thank the residents of St. Vital for their votes and for placing their trust in me in representing them in the legislature for the next four years. St. Vital, it really is a beautiful place to live. If you haven't been there, you should definitely come visit or even move to St. Vital. When I think about St. Vital, I think about St. Vital Park. I think about its gorgeous, well-known duck pond and its award-winning, fully accessible toboggan slide. I think about the St. Vital Museum in Far Hall that has maintained a wonderful history of our community. I think about the community centers such as Windsor and Norbury Glen Lee that have provided countless activities, services, recreation to the neighborhood. I think about the great schools whose teachers work hard every day to educate young people. I think about the people who live on Marlene Street, Moore Avenue, as well as those who live on Kingston Crescent and Victoria Crescent. I want to work hard together as a community to build solutions that will make all of our lives better in St. Vital truly is a fantastic place to live. You know, families young and old live in St. Vital, and I've spoken to many seniors who often share the concerns regarding affordability. Affordability really is a big issue, especially the rising cost of housing. With many seniors in St. Vital living in apartment blocks, rent increases are not, are not, uh, so, slowly, are not so slowly pricing people out of where they live. Another issue is facing seniors is the cost of health care services, including prescriptions, that forces many seniors to make difficult and often impossible decisions between medication and food or shelter. Additionally, another big issue is the cost of, rising cost of public transportation. So many people around our city and province face uh, these tough decisions, and especially seniors are, are faced with the difficulty of getting around our city, and I think they deserve a better quality of life, especially in their golden years. Now, I was born and raised right here in Winnipeg to my parents who immigrated from Trinidad and Tobago, and among the reasons they chose to leave here are the opportunities here for furthering education, quality healthcare services, and good options for work that are available to us in Manitoba. Those are the reasons that I wanted to get into politics myself. The same way my parents provided better living conditions for their children, I want to make Manitoba a better place for my two children. Though through their words and action, my parents taught me about faith, service to the community, and how to respect people around us. I'm proud to carry those qualities into the chamber today, and I thank my parents for that. They not only raised me and my siblings to support their family, uh, but supported my family here and their family back at home. And they succeeded because of the hope that the challenges of today would become the experiences and life lessons of tomorrow. I learned that education is the key to creating a better future, not only for yourself, but for those around you too. Education allows people to prepare themselves to have a better future. It is the roots by which the tree of our society is anchored. Unfortunately, through this government's actions, and again restated in the throne speech, it has been starving our education system. There are less educational supports, more pressure put on teachers with larger classroom sizes, and it is beyond time that we stop treating students and teachers as simply cogs in a machine to churn out more employees for our economy, but rather as unique individuals who need to be nurtured through our education system so that they can become the best people possible. This can be accomplished by working together to correct some of the issues that may prevent students from learning, such as poverty, 
homelessness, mental health issues and addiction. I fear this government's educational review will be used as a tool to reduce and cut educational supports. And I urge this government to use this review as an opportunity to truly put the best interests of Manitobans, Manitoban students first. As I grew up, I was inspired by my older siblings to play sports, and I played just about every sport I could, basketball, football, volleyball, track and field. And while I enjoyed every moment, I learned, I learned lessons. I learned lessons about teamwork, putting the team in front of your, head, your own interests. I learned lessons about focusing on the moment, that things in the past are fixed or set, they're lessons to be learned, that things in the future are to be planned for but can't be acted on yet, but it's only the moment now when we can actually make a difference and make some positive contributions. I continued to play sports at the University of Manitoba as a bison football athlete, and I learned, uh, as I learned from my parents, education was key. I used sport to further my education and graduated with a degree from the University of Manitoba. And now as critic for economic development and training, I'm very concerned about the government's use of that term simply training. The post-secondary edu education institutions in our province are more than training. They're places of higher learning, places for Manitobans to cultivate ideas, educate themselves for their lives and not just for their careers. Develop research to help the greater community both locally and abroad. It's important to ensure that our post-secondary institutions will allow their students to thrive and be successful and not just be pigeonholed into only training students towards mandated outcomes. We need to ensure our post-secondary institutions become more affordable for all Manitobans, but especially for those who aren't able to afford it. Additionally, we need to make a conscious effort in our post-secondary institutions to promote diversity because diversity in our colleges and universities become diversity in all levels of our workforce. After I graduated from U of M, I chose to stay and work right here in Manitoba, turning down offers in other provinces. I worked for several companies, but most notably I worked for the Canadian Wheat Board. And I, during my time there, I saw the staff work hard day in, day out for the farmers of Western Canada. And when the Harper Conservatives removed the monopoly from the Canadian Wheat Board, it effectively meant that hundreds of workers right here in Winnipeg were going to lose their jobs. My Conservative MP at the time agreed, that, agreed with those changes, even though it meant that dozens of people in her riding were facing job loss. The NDP were there standing up for workers and prairie farmers, and I thought, if one politician can make a decision that would affect so many people negatively, why couldn't I be part of supporting a party that would make a positive impact? Today, I am proud to be supporting a party that puts the people of Manitoba first. I choose to put my name behind a party that has demonstrated that it values the individual cultural backgrounds of people, and I am an example of this. As the first black man elected, as, as an elected member of the Legislative Assembly of Manitoba, I truly am honored to represent the community of people that haven't had this type of representation before. Like other minority groups, black people have, have and continue to face discrimination and prejudice. However, this past election proves that there is hope. There is hope for black people and people of minority groups that there is a brighter future. A future where there are more opportunities for people of color. A future where there is hope that Manitoba can become a more fair, a more equal, a more just society for all Manitobans. So I stand here today as a Canadian, as a black man, as the son of immigrants from Trinidad and Tobago, as a husband and as a father, and as the MLA for St. Vital. And it has given me the hope that truly all things are possible. Hope has fueled my life. And it was hope that helped me overcome so many challenges and find success. It is that hope that I want to pass on to every young person, every person, old or young, that it is true that a brighter tomorrow is within your reach. 
that your challenges can be met and that your dreams can become a reality. Because in the national motto of Trinidad and Tobago, together we aspire, together we achieve. Thank you. The Honourable Member for St. John's. Miigwech, uh, Deputy Speaker. I'm uh, pleased to get up in the House today, my first, almost first opportunity to get up in the House of this new legislative uh, session to put a couple of words on the record in respect of uh, this uh, Premier's uh, last throne speech. First, I want to begin by uh, just acknowledging um, the amazing constituents of St. John's who once again elected me and decidedly elected me as well. I'm very proud of that. I'm proud to have gone door to door and have not only folks uh, certainly know who I am and uh, be encouraging of the work that I've been trying to do as the St. John's MLA, but also the children. And I'm, I'm very, very proud of that, that even kids in St. John's uh, were encouraging their parents to vote for me because I went to their school. And uh, that's something that I'm very uh, proud of and very appreciative. I want to acknowledge all of the volunteers that worked on the St. John's uh, campaign. We were uh, a small uh, but mighty team. In particular, I want to acknowledge um, Ben Capilli. So Ben Capilli was my constituency assistant. And uh, he is probably one of the most uh, loyal, most brilliant uh, folks that I've ever had an opportunity to work so closely with. He was my trusted um, confident, and um, he has gone on. He is traveling now. He's in California. He's going to be going to the Philippines. Uh, he wanted to take a little time off to go, and he's actually a photographer, and so he's going around to go take uh, photographs of movements that are occurring across the globe. So to 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 Ben. I say miigwech and uh, know that he is loved and I, he is obviously quite missed. I want to take a couple of minutes just to acknowledge our caucus and in particular our new caucus members. Um, you know, you will recall this, Deputy Speaker, that at one point your boss got up in this house and talked about having the most diverse caucus in the history of Canada. Everybody remembers that. Yeah. And, and every time we say that, members opposite get so excited, but they don't understand the definition of diversity. Because if you looked at that caucus, you would never put the word diversity to the PC caucus. Not in a million years would you ever do that. And so I'm proud that this NDP caucus represents Manitobans and the members can chatter on and say shame all they want. It's not my fault that they don't understand what diversity is and that they don't demand better and more from their boss. That's not my fault. What I'm excited about is that our caucus, when you look on this side of the house, this represents Manitobans and this is what this house should look like. This is what every single politician in this House Order. should look like. It should look like the Manitoban population. Besides, and I want to congratulate the member for Southdale, I think that uh, it is a very historical moment for all of us to have the member for Southdale, the member for Union Station, and the member for St. Vitale elected is something we can all be proud of. I'm certainly proud that uh, our caucus has uh, supported and elected the first ever black, queer, non-gender conforming politician across Canada. That's something that we are incredibly proud of and uh, something that we should all be proud of in this House. So I do congratulate each of the new members. I'm proud of this caucus that we represent Manitobans. We represent Manitobans not only in the way that we look, 
but in our experiences, in our language, in our gender, in our um, ethno-cultural analysis and worldview of the world that we bring into this chamber. I'm proud, and I say miigwech to each and every one of my caucus members that ran and got elected. I'm proud to sit in this chamber with them. Uh, you know, when we talk about the throne speech, which incidentally you will know, Deputy Speaker, none of your colleagues want to get up in the House and talk about. I think that that is certainly a testament to none of your colleagues have any confidence in what their boss brought forward, the direction that their boss wants to go for in respect of Manitoba. It is telling that nobody wants to get up from the other side of the House and talk about your throne speech. This is your throne speech. If it was my throne speech, you could be darn sure that I would be using every single second of my 20 minutes to talk about how proud I am of this throne speech. But actually, as you know, Deputy Speaker, none of your members are getting up today. They're not getting up tomorrow or when we finish. I think that that's telling. I think that it's telling that Manitobans should know about that. So why do none of your members want to get up? Here's why none of your members want to get up. In the throne speech, did the throne speech talk about in any substantial way about the meth crisis? No. Did the throne speech in any substantial way talk about reproductive health, like abortion or birthing services in Flin Flon? No. Did the throne speech talk in any substantial way or even mention the word poverty? Absolutely not. They clearly didn't read their own throne speech because they're talking that they're saying yes, yes, yes. Poverty wasn't even mentioned once. They didn't read the throne speech. Maybe that's why they're not getting up because they're like, oh no, I didn't read the throne speech. How can I get up and actually talk about the throne speech? Did they talk about social housing? No. No, they did not. Why? Because this government, this Pallister government, their boss has seen fit to actually sell social ho housing. When we are in the midst of very uh, low social housing stocks, what does this government do? It sells social housing. It makes absolutely no sense. Did the throne speech talk in any substantial manner about the environment? No. That's why they don't want to get up. Or, interestingly enough, did the throne speech talk in any substantial, honest, courageous way about the sexual harassment of women in the workplace? Absolutely not. And I know that, uh, and I don't know, I think he's from Radisson, is chattering on and chirping about whatever he wants to chirp about. But the bottom line is that this government repeatedly gets up and talks about a no door or no wrong door policy. That's absolutely wrong. And in fact, the member for Flin Flon said that it should be changed to a no open door because anytime there's complaints that come forward, it's just a free for all and everybody gets to stay in this chamber and get reelected. And then the rest of us have to sit here every single day and look at individuals that we know have sexually harassed women and have actually forced women to leave their job. But we're all required to sit in this very chamber with those very individuals. Order. Maybe that's why none of the members want to get up in the House and speak to the throne speech. I don't know. Maybe they don't want to talk about that. It's important to talk about these issues in a very open and transparent way. So I'm surprised that this government and all of your colleagues who keep touting about this no wrong door aren't wanting to get up in the House and talk about the sexual harassment of women in the workplace, but they don't want to. What I want to do today, uh, Deputy Speaker, as you know, what was mentioned in the throne speech? What was mentioned? The Premier's fixation on dismantling democracy in Manitoba. Once again, that was a priority or is a priority of your boss, the Premier, when he talks about that he's going to get rid of the, the, the rest of the 25 per cent uh, rebate that candidates get in order to run in this Manitoba legislature. That is the priority of the Premier, to dismantle, even though he tries to come across, you know, across Canada 
as if he is trying to bring all of Canada together. All of a sudden, we're not sure why he's doing that. You know, we, there's there's rumors, there's innuendos that he wants to be the new leader for the for the federal PC. Co- uh, uh, Conservatives, maybe that's true, who knows? There's rumors that he wants to retire early, forcing us to have another early election in three years or two and a half. Who knows what he's going to do? Who knows what the, the Premier is going to do? But here's what the Premier's done since he took office. Because let's just face it, he hates democracy. He hates that there are people that we should be encouraging and supporting to ensure that we have an equitable legislature in this province. Here's what he's done. He's got, he passed Bill 240, which was the Elections Amendment Act. Bill, good for you. at some point to know that at this very moment, at 3.49 on November 26th, the members of the PC caucus were clapping that their boss is seeking to dismantle democracy in Manitoba. They should be so proud of themselves. What's the other bill that we saw? Well, as you know, Deputy Speaker, we saw Bill 16, which was embedded in BITSA. Uh, And then we saw Bill 9, the Elections Financing Amendment Act. We saw Bill 26, the Election Financing Act again, which that act, as you will recall, was an increase from $2,500 to $5,000. So what they've done, what, what, what your boss, what your colleagues have done, has ensured that, de- that dismantling of democracy here in Manitoba, that those that need the support the most to be able to, to sit in this chamber and represent communities that are still not represented, they have ensured, your boss has ensured that they will not be able to sit here. But what they've done is, what your boss has done is made sure that all of his rich friends can donate $5,000 to particular candidates that they like and uh, ensure that, or, or hopefully seek to ensure from his perspective that they get in once again. What is interesting, and you may or may not know this, is that constituents in St. John's know what the Premier's doing. Every door that I went to, uh, every single door that I went to, they would say, your premier, the premier, does not care about Manitoba. I had, uh, and I want to share this story, and he asked me to share this story when we got back into the house. He was so, uh, you know, he was having such a difficult time sharing this story that about, I think it was about eight or nine months ago now, his siblings were, in, were uh, visiting his mum, who was in the Victoria Hospital. They all happened to be in the Victoria Hospital visiting their mum. And their sister, while at the Victoria Hospital, had a stroke. She, would, she could not be admitted at the Victoria Hospital. They brought her by a non-emergency vehicle to the to St. Boniface Hospital, where she was turned away from St. Boniface Hospital and told to go to the Health Science Center. Again, she was transported again in a non-emergency vehicle. By the time she got to the Health Science Center, she died. Now, I know you all want to pretend that the changes that you have made in respect of the healthcare system, you have, uh, what's the saying, you're, you're, you're brainwashed into believing that those are good results or those were needed uh, decisions that had to be made. People lost their lives. That's not the first person that I heard. That's not the first constituent. I heard from another constituent who's lived in his house for 50 years. Him and his wife uh, have lived there for 50 years. He spoke about his friend who could no longer go to Seven Oaks and happened to just be going to Rona or or Home Depot in St. James. He had a heart attack while he was out there. The ambulance was called. The ambulance drove past the Grace Hospital to the Health Science Center through traffic. By the time he got to the Health Science Center, he died. 
So just in St. Joe, and those are just the, a couple of stories that I, that I have time to share with you. Under your watch, under the Premier's watch, under this Premier's watch, I know just two individuals, two families that have lost their lives because of the changes that were made to the healthcare system. And I don't see any of the members clapping now, because how can you clap for that? How can you clap knowing that Manitobans are being diverted to different hospitals and in the process are losing their lives? That brother was so upset, so upset, and he wanted to, I promised him, he said, promise me that you will tell this story in the house. My sister was in the hospital when she had a stroke, in the hospital, and she died. And that may not mean anything to anybody uh, opposite in this chamber, but it certainly means something to her family and to her young children that she left. So, you know, when, you, when the members opposite, Deputy Speaker, do not get up to speak to their throne speech, to the, your boss's throne speech, it is shameful because the decisions, and I've said this before, when before we broke and we had a, the, the Premier decide to break the election law and call an early election, I repeatedly said that every single member opposite is, in, is complicit in what is going on in Manitoba. Every single member opposite is complicit that people are dying from addictions. Every single member is opposite is complicit that people are homeless right now because of the, the social housing stock that the, the Premier has saw, seen fit to sell off. Every single member in this House opposite is complicit when we do not talk about the sexual harassment of women in this House, and we have individuals that sit in this House and are elected to this chamber, every single member opposite is in complicit in a woman being forced to lose her job in this House. Complicit. And so I want, and I've said this repeatedly, every time I have an opportunity to get up in the House and speak, I want Manitobans I don't know when they're going to read Hansard. I don't know when they're going to read this particular uh, throne speech debate. But I want them to know that on November 26, 4.13 p.m., 2019, every single member from the PC caucus is complicit in what we see on our streets. And while I hear them again just chippering about and, and again dis, dis, dismissing what Manitobans are going through. I want Manitobans to know that they're also doing that. And they take pride in the decisions that have been made that people have lost their lives. They take pride that poverty was not mentioned once in the throne speech. They take pride that there are children, as my colleague, uh, the member for Notre Dame, spoke about in her uh, throne speech debate, uh, about the poverty that children are going to school hungry. Every single member opposite is complicit in that. Uh, I only have a couple of minutes left. I know members opposite wa want me to go on for longer. Unfortunately, I can only go on for 20 minutes. I do want to say this. I want to kind of close with this. There have been several community forums in the last several weeks. Uh, the member for uh, Point Douglas, the member for Union Station, the member for the Maples, the member for uh, Burroughs, the member for Notre Dame. All of us have attended these community gatherings. Uh, the member for Union Station and myself and the member for Maples just on Sunday were at another community gathering uh, with the African community talking about what's going on in the city. Here's maybe something you may or may not know, Deputy Speaker. All of these community gatherings, not one single member of the PC caucus has been there. Not one minister, not the premier, not any of the, the chirping backbenchers, not one single person has gone to any single community justice forum to sit down with community and to hear directly from community about what is going on, what is needed, their expertise, not one single one. Every single community forum that I go to, I specifically look like, oh, today? Are we going to see a member of the PC caucus? And sure enough, 
Never one single PC caucus. Where are they? They're always at banquets and they're always doing this and that. And that's great, that's great. We're at those banquets too. We're at those banquets too. But where are the PC caucus members? Order. The Honourable Member for St. John's. I know that the members are probably feeling really uncomfortable because they're being called out on not going to community forums, but that's what they get paid for. We're getting paid to serve the community. We're getting paid to listen to the community. I don't know what they're getting paid to do, but they should be listening to the community. And I hope that anybody that goes back and reads Hansard knows none of them show up. They don't show up in community, and they certainly don't show up here. The Honourable Member for the PAW, Kami Sack. Thank you, um, Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. It's an absolute honour to stand here once again as the MLA for the PAW, which are, we are now known as the PAW Kamisak. If everyone wants to know, Kamisak is the Cree word for big, uh, referring to we now encompass Lake Winnipeg. And with that change, due to the electoral boundaries, I like to say that my constituency has become even more diverse. Um, <coughs> 11 new communities were added to my constituencies. And I had the honour and privilege to visit each community, um, which includes Grand Rapids, Easterville, uh, Dauphin River, Lake St. Martin, Little Saskatchewan, Pinay Mutang, Peguis, Fisher River Cree Nation, Jackhead, Matheson Island, and Pine Dock. Might I add, they're all Indigenous communities, right? So um, during the election time, I'd like to, uh, first of all, congratulate and thank from the bottom of my heart probably the hardest working campaign manager in Manitoba and probably all of Canada where he's actually sought after in other provinces for him to lead our NDP campaigns. His name is Gordon Landrio. He's, he's hard to miss because he's always wearing a neon orange um, hat or jacket so that's how we can di differentiate him from our crowd. Gordon Landro has been involved with the union since the beginning of time. He's also a former miner. He also worked for my late father, Oscar Lathlin, a former MLA for the PAW. He's also worked on Frank Whitehead's campaign, former MLA for the PAW as well, and Nikki Ashton and numerous others. And I like to say that Nikki Ashton's lovingly refer to Gord as Papa Gord. And I also want to um, acknowledge um, my daughters. Um, in this chamber, I like to uh, toot my own horn. According to the member of Elmer, Elmwood, this is the best place to toot your own horn. So let me talk about my daughters. My daughters, Elise Laughlin and Natanis Pascal. Elise is 16 and Natanis is 15. They both came on the campaign trail with me. And I'd like to suggest to every member in this house here, take your, take your children out on the campaign trail. Go canvassing, go door knocking, go to public events with your children. With this experience that my both teenagers have had, and I'd like to remind my, my colleagues here, I have shared personally stories where my teenagers have been medevaced out from the Paw to Winnipeg or to Brandon because of self-harm issues, depression. And with this experience, it really helped them overcome these issues and Gave them that confidence and that courage that is needed, especially with uh, the era that we're in now with our, with our youth. So with my two daughters, we went canvassing, door knocking, avoiding dog bites as well, might I add. Um, I've been bitten five times on this campaign trail alone. So I just wanted to say that this experience has really opened up my daughters where they became more confident and there was this one time after the campaign was done, my daughter faced um, um, a stressful moment. And she said to me, she was, Mom, if I can go door to door and ask for political support, then I can do anything. 
<laughs> so with that, I just wanted to acknowledge that because of this experience, my daughter, Elise Laughlin, is now a member of the Junior Chief and Council for Pasquia Cree Nation. So that makes three generations in our political family. Thank you. And my other daughter, Natanis, received three excellent awards for, for marks in the 90s and three subjects in her high school. So I'd like to congratulate her on that as well. Thank you. So I wanted to uh, elaborate more on what our member for St. Vitale was saying. When I went to Fisher River and, and Peguas, I met up with a lot of youth and um, um, they actually refer to that they have never voted before. And those are the best conversations that one can have with people who haven't voted before. And they were actually surprised that they actually met up with a politician or even an MLA in the Interlake area to actually talk about issues that are important to our communities. Now, the one thing I really like to talk about is uh, healthcare. This government says delivering healthcare services sooner. Not even, not even, not even if you're living in the paw. Because in Flin Flon, we don't even have a doctor to deliver babies, right? I went to that demonstration march in Flin Flon, along with my pal here from member for Flin Flon and member for Notre Dame, yes. So i like to acknowledge this young lady here and her family. I think it took them 12 hours to, from Winnipeg to Flin Flon. I would have turned back at Ashran, but no, she kept on going with children in tow, and she looked absolutely exhausted when she arrived in Flint Flon, right when the, our conference, our meeting was almost done. So we heard awful stories about this woman who didn't even know she had gestational diabetes because of the lack of health care, especially with women who are pregnant. She just found out on the way on the ambulance ride to La Paw, she has gesta gestational diabetes. That's unacceptable. We deserve better than that. And also, too, it's no surprise that the Paw, our New Year's baby, was from Flim Flam. Also, too, um, just listening to our women having to leave their communities to deliver their children reminds me of what our First Nations go through. See, this is a norm for us First Nations women who have to leave our community in order to, to uh, deliver our babies. For example, in Cross Lake. Cross Lake has an opportunity to have a hospital. Cross Lake Chief at the time, Chief Kathy Merrick said, it'd be wonderful to have a birth certificate that will actually say Cross Lake instead of Winnipeg or Thompson, right? So, I just wanted to say that Flin Flon is ex exactly experiencing what our First Nations have become accustomed to and conditioned to, to deliver babies with a, without their husbands or family around them. We don't like it. And I also wanted to talk about something that really hit our home um, in a tragic, tragic way. Privatized life flight. I happen to be talking to someone whose brother, who just suffered a heart attack that morning in the paw, was taken to the hospital at 10.30 in the morning, and it wasn't until 10.30 at night that a plane was finally available to transfer our patient to Winnipeg in order to get the medicine started in his system after one suffers a heart attack. You know what, Deputy Speaker? At 10.30 at night, I heard that plane that same very plane who finally arrived fly over my house as I was getting interviewed by CBC. So, Unacceptable. Yeah. So the Premier was in the paw um, uh, filming a commercial. I heard he was going to be in town. And I was across the river attending the funeral of the late Gordon Jeb, who passed away after his heart attack, where there was no life flight to take him to Winnipeg. After the, pre after the funeral was done, drove across the river, walked up to his little party, crashed his party, no pun intended, and I asked him, we deserve answers. What happened on that day? Why did it take 12 hours for a plane to arrive in the paw and take our patient back to Winnipeg? There was a bed waiting for him at the Health Science Center, but no plane. So, after a brief talk with him, the Premier promised me answers as to, and the family, as to what happened to that day, on that day. We still don't have answers, and that's truly, truly, un, 
disrespectful to us Northerners, especially to this family who wanted an inquiry into his death. So, and in regards to education, I was one of the um, participants in the K-12 review. They came to the PAW in March, and I was just pleased that we had many, many, many teachers attending that uh, important gathering regarding our children's education. And I just wanted to share that the largest circle, there was like maybe 12 circles, 12 circles pertaining to each subject, like to poverty, uh, mental health, recruitment and retention of teachers. And guess what? The largest circle was regarding mental health. That's the one I stayed put in because I had a lot of personal experience in regards to our children, in regards to mental health. I could tell, I've shared many, many times here, that we do not have psychiatric assessments for our children in northern and rural Manitoba. So what do we do? We ship them off in a plane or a bus or a car, whoever can afford that, to Winnipeg or Brandon. So we're furthering their stress on their mental health. We're, make, we're asking them to leave your family, leave your community, leave your friends, and go somewhere in a hospital and get assessed for only 10 minutes. Only 10 minutes. That's all we get, our children, to leave our communities and only talk to a psychiatrist for only 10 minutes. That is unacceptable. We need those services in the north so we can adequately address our mental health issues. And guess what? Thank you. Suicide crisis. That is a, that is a product because of our lack of mental health resources for our children. Also, to, in regards to lack of, um, of um, services in the north. This was something I learned new and which I want to address with my colleagues and work with the members opposites. Did you know that rape kits are not done for youth in northern and rural Manitoba? Yeah. Once again, they have to leave their community without showering, without changing their clothes after their attack. They have to leave to Winnipeg to get this rape kit done at the Health Science Centre. Again, that is absolutely unacceptable for our children. So that needs to be changed. And again, I want to work with my colleagues and members opposite to make sure that services is provided for our children. And that's coming from a personal experience. And in regards to, as well, I wanted to talk about CFS. As the family's critic with CFS, I personally know the hardships, the heartache, the nightmare that families have to face when children are apprehended by this system. Deputy Speaker, this system is just another form of residential schools taken of our children, okay? I find that when parents and children are separated, even if just one it's like it's more reactive, right? And when children or mothers or parents or grandparents, aunts and uncles are separated, it doesn't make sense to me that these families are asked to heal while separated. Mom, take parenting class. Kids, good luck, all right? When we did a committee, uh, committee um, process regarding customary care for the CFS Act, the question I asked, shouldn't it be part of this policy where once children and parents are separated, compulsory counseling should be provided to these families? It's already hard enough that when families are separated, addictions go up, depression goes up, suicide goes up. Deputy Speaker, a couple of weeks ago, we just buried a young mother whose children were apprehended from her for many, many years. Whatever she did was not good enough. Counseling, addictions counseling, even trying to find a home, she never got her children back. And guess what? She took her own life two weeks ago. So that has to be changed. The whole culture of this whole CFS system has to be changed. The culture has to be changed itself. All parents and all grandparents, aunts and uncles should not be painted with that same brush that social workers, the system sees us as that we're all bad, irresponsible, awful people. So with that, I just want to encourage the Minister of Families that we need more resources, more counselling. We don't need 
What is this review going to uh, consist of? To us, when I hear review, it means cuts. Already, we're already seeing it in the West Region, tri uh, CFS agency there, where there were, the, the words were, uh, I forgot what the words like, find funding or retain funding. Well, those two words were scary because this organization is mandated by this very government to meet the obligations for our children and families, but yet the services such as wraparound services for our youth have been cut. Frontline services, frontline training for our workers have been cut as well. Two crucial areas for the system in order to at least, um, at least respect our families in any way. So by removing those wraparound services for our youth, it's going to erase any chance a child has to have a future after aging out of the system. So also too, with, um, with Northern issues, once again, the word tourism, tourism, that's all I hear. That's all this government sees us as. They come into our area, sit down and have these little coffee meetings they call consultations, and they arrive as tourists, because that's all I hear, North tourism, North tourism. In this throne speech here, not once, when, it, when we talk about the North, not once do we talk about getting rid of, our, uh, of a lot of our water boil advisories. If you look on the webpage, like majority of those communities are in my constituency, water boil advisories. We're in 2019, you know, we should get it together and actually have drinkable water for all Manitobans. For example, in my own community of Cormorant, they were without drinking water for four months. I talked to the Minister of Indigenous and Northern Relations. She said, yeah, I knew about it. I, I got an update every two days. Okay, well, if you knew about it, why didn't you do Why didn't you declare the state of an emergency? So for four months, our folks couldn't even wash clothes, couldn't even drink water, couldn't even bathe their children. Children were missing school. Halloween, they said they didn't want to get their children um, painted up for Halloween because they had no water to wash off the makeup afterwards. Just shameful, shameful. So now Cormorant has their water back after the minister's office was given a couple of emails and texts and calls. Finally, they got their water back. And I just want to commend the, um, our civil servant who works in that department went and beyond his duty to make sure that Cormorant got its water pump back. By the way, it was um, destroyed by arson by a couple of use. So with tourism, again, Northern Manitoba should not only be included with tourism. These folks across have to remember that. We have to think about access to uh, health care services. Flynn Flon in the Paw. We, we were promised a, a clinic in the Paw, which would have better served us, Northern Manitobans, including my family, because the ER is being clogged up as a walk in clinic. And guess what? The walk in clinic ups, upstairs is only open six days a month. So the ER is clogged up with people who just want to see a doctor. What's also, a walk-in clinic? Yeah, no kidding. It's like chase the ace that we have down there. You know, you're lucky if you get in. And also, too, education. You know, um, access to education uh, is, a, is a crucial um, issue in northern Manitoba. Suicide crisis, and again, like I mentioned, access to mental health uh, resources. <coughs> It was uh, interesting to see here, only one sentence though, Operation Return Home will be concluded for the people of Lake St. Martin First Nation who have been separated from their traditional lands long enough. During my campaign, it was quite eerie, Deputy Speaker, when I went into Lake St. Martin, seeing their old place always left, it's just the foundations of the home. It was like a ghost town. That's where they were there for many, many years, and then a flood happened, and then they were here in Winnipeg, heard firsthand stories about children, children's schools, um, education being messed up, suicide, depression, addictions developed, and then now going into their new community and having to adjust that, and then with the power outage as well. So enough is enough. Our First Nations community deserve more than that. So in conclusion, I have to agree that the programs and services in Northern Manitoba need to be developed, improved, and preserved. Northern Manitobans, including myself, are frustrated with this government's cuts to any program and services. 
All Manitobans deserve access to quality services and program programming to give them the best quality of life possible. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I am here for the next four years. I want to stay here for the next four years, not three years, and fulfill my <laughs> obligation as an MLA, as an elected representative in this chamber. It's an absolute honour to voice my concerns, to voice my love for my community, my members. It's an absolute honour to be here again, and I'm getting verklempt. <laughs> but we should all be here and be proud and honour why we're here and take this job seriously by perhaps speaking to your own speech from the throne. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Point Douglas. Well, miigwech, Madam, uh, Deputy Speaker. First of all, I just want to thank my constituent my constituents of Point Douglas for once again electing me. Not only electing me, but actually I won in every single poll in my constituency. And that should send a message to this government that this government isn't taking care of people in the North End. They won't vote for them because they don't care about people who are in poverty, they don't care about people who need housing, they don't care about safety in communities. The bottom line for this government is money. They put money over people continually. We've seen that. We're now at 41 deaths in this province, and what has this government done? Nothing. They've cut funding to municipalities, so they're not able to uh, have the full policing uh, complement that they should need. I just finished meeting with uh, Medicine Bear Counseling Service that actually supports missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls and two-spirited people. And they, you know, shared that some of the officers that were in Project Devote that actually supported families were pulled off of Project uh, Devote to go work uh, with the Winnipeg Police because they've underfunded the Winnipeg Police and they have, you know, no other recourse but to take policing from other areas to support uh, safety in the community. Does this government care? No. You know, people continue to die under the watch of this government. And, you know, I'm, I'm surprised. Actually, I'm not surprised. The, not, uh, the, the MLAs on that side can't even get up to support their own throne speech budget. Really? This is coming from your government and you can't even get up and talk about it? it just shows Manitobans that you don't care about this budget. You don't support it, but of course you have someone who tells you time and time what you're going to do, when you're going to do it, and you're voiceless, which is unfortunate because you represent all of Manitobans which includes the constituency of Point Douglas, which are suffering at the hands of this government. They've sold off housing. They've put the management into other people's hands. So now what's happening with people who are living in social housing? They're getting evicted. They get one warning. So I'll give you an example. One of my constituents called me and said, you know, I forgot to change the battery. Actually, she didn't even have money to change the battery in her, um, her smoke alarm. They came in, they did an inspection, saw that she didn't have a working fire alarm. They gave her an eviction. Her and her three children had to move. Another woman who's going through dialysis is like almost on her deathbed. Her daughter was found in the river last summer. She has bed bugs. She was asked to move her, her furniture from the walls of her, her apartment. She couldn't even do that because she didn't have the strength. And what did this government do? They served her with an eviction. While her daughter was murdered and she doesn't have answers while she's on her deathbed, while she's going through dialysis, does this government care? No. What do they care about? They care about saving money. They care about putting money on kitchen tables. They don't care about people who are struggling. What did we find out just this week, actually yesterday, that they've, caught, they've uh, cut the special benefit to people with disabilities? 
$200 to up to 600 people that are struggling with mental health issues. All of us, I'm sure, at some point of our life have struggled with mental health issues and have had to, you know, take a cab or pick up that phone to call someone. That's what they're taking away from those people, the ability to take a cab to go and get some support, which could mean saving their life, which might have to cut off their cell phone, which, you know, is social isolation. They might have to cut off their internet, but does this government care? No. They are only worried about money. They are not worried about people. Continually, they have shown that. They've put uh, management for social housing under other uh, management services. They don't want the responsibility of having to manage housing. Why not? Because they want to give that responsibility of kicking people out who actually need that housing out of their apartments, out of their houses. And I'll give you another example. I have uh, a family right now of three. Her children were just taken away. So she's been living there for about a month. She was told that she has to move out because she doesn't have her children. And she was given an eviction notice. So you tell me, is that fair? She's working on getting her children back. You know, we, we all struggle at some point in our life, but this government doesn't care about those that are struggling. What they care about is putting people in jail. They care about having this heavy-handed where they think, oh, I'm going to incarcerate someone that's, uh, you know, on drugs because they're dealing with trauma in their life and they're trying to suppress what's happened to them. And they figure that they're going to put them in jail and that's going to, like, solve everything. Well, let me tell you, I've worked with level four car thieves and I've seen that that does not work. I ran a program that was an alternative program that worked with level four car thieves. In the morning, they would come and learn academics. In the afternoon, they would do acade or, uh, alternatives. So whether that was helping them get some job skills, getting them back into regular school, helping them to become independent adults, building up their self-esteem. No. Does this government want to invest in anything like that? No. They would rather put people in jail and expect that, oh, they're going to go into jail, they're going to learn their lesson, they're going to come out and they're going to be different human beings. Well, let me tell you, that doesn't happen. What happens is they just come out even angrier. And this government has no plans to address that. They've cut services to people who are in jail that could actually get some skills, some job skills, to be able to come out and put something on their actual resume. They cut that. So what does a person do when they're in jail? Well, they sit, they watch TV, and they get three square meals. They don't learn really anything. There's no alternative to that. Uh, this government is only worried about putting people in jail. So if someone's struggling with, you know, mental health issues and, you know, something happens, they'll put them in jail even with their mental health issues and not deal with their mental health. It's like, oh, well, you've committed a crime. Too bad, so sad. In jail you go. I want to talk about poverty. You know, this government has no strategy on addressing poverty in this province. We have, you know, more people in poverty since this government's taken uh, government in the last three years, three plus years, and this government is proud about putting 3,000 more people on rent assist, that's because they've put them in, onto, uh, into poverty. They've cut this, they've cut that, they've cut that. They've put more people on EIA on the, in the welfare trap than any other government. I know people who have lost their jobs and have had to go on EI, can't find another job, they can't, you know, uh, afford to take care of their family now, and they find themselves as a single parent having to take care of four children, maybe five children. Does this government care? No. And let's talk about EIA. So a lot of our casework has to do with, you know, people uh, accessing EIA. And a person has the right to access EIA, and this government is making it even more difficult for people to access it. They're now expected to make an appointment. So you go to this appointment, you hear the information, and then they give you another appointment. And your, your next appointment is over 30 days. So in estimates, I asked the Minister of Families, I said, 
what, how long are people actually waiting before they actually receive any benefits? And the minister said, one week. Well, I can tell you, out of uh, the dozens and dozens of people that come into our office that are trying to access EIA, that they are waiting more than 30 days. That means people don't have anywhere to live. They're either couch surfing or they're homeless and having to access you know, Slow Mission or Salvation Army. People shouldn't have to live like that, but that's what this government is creating. And do they care? No, because they know what they're doing. They're doing it intentionally. They're doing it because they don't care about people who live in poverty. And we see this with people going in, uh, you know, committing crimes to get their needs met. Someone goes into a grocery store to steal some food. It, they're doing it because they're hungry. They're not doing it because they want to go and commit a crime. And, you know, I hear this, or this, uh, our premier say, you know, oh, we're going to go and we're going to catch them and you just watch, you can't hide from us. Like, really? Like, who are you serving? You're serving the 1% corporation who, who makes tons of money, but what about the other 99%? You know, I think about uh, the less fortunate here in Manitoba, and I know I've seen lots of these MLAs come out and they, they, they do their good deed and they'll come and they'll serve, you know, turkey at certain times of the year, but I don't see them do anything else. I don't see them coming and helping these families. Families come into our office hungry, asking, we need some food. You know, we've gone to the food bank. We've got our food bank allowance for this, this week. We help them because we care. But I, I don't know if I could say that about any MLA on that side, if they would do that. And it's unfortunate because, you know, it's our responsibility as Manitobans, as human beings, to help one another, to care about one another, to share with one another. Somehow we've become this uh, consumerism, uh, you know, of people that just, I want more cars, I want more houses, I want more land, and it's like we forget about people and that not everybody can do that. We have two houses, three houses, some people don't even have one house, and uh, you know, this government doesn't care. And I think about, um, you know, our health care, and we were talking about Dynacare yesterday, and my doctor actually, when I go see her, I'm able to access uh, to go and get blood taken right in her office. But when I went for my, uh, my last checkup, she told me, she said, well, you're no longer going to be able to, to come and see me uh, or to go get your blood here after you've seen me. You're going to have to go to Garden City. And I mean, Garden City's not, not that far for me. I have a car, I'm able to, to go there. But I think about our seniors, and my doctor's been practicing, I've been with her now for about 30 years, and many of the people that are sitting in her uh, waiting area are elderly people. I think about those people that are on fixed incomes, that aren't able to leave her office and take a taxi or get on a bus that have mobility issues and go into this big mall. And it's not as soon as you walk in the door, because if you've been to Garden City, you can see all of the, the renovations going on. It's, it's a trot to, to be able to get to where they're going to put this, what they call super center, uh, super, super what? Site. Super site. Uh, so, you know, but does this government care? No, There's, they, they think that this is a good idea. They're not listening to Manitobans. They're out of touch. And, you know, seniors and people with access accessibility issues deserve to go to their doctor and be able to have their blood taken right there. I think about uh, our ER our closures. And it just blows my mind how this government can think that closing three ERs is going to reduce wait times. I mean, they can do the math, although they'll tote it in here and say, oh, the wait times have reduced. We know that not, that's not true. We know that they've changed the metrics on how they count people. So if you go into the doctor, you go into the uh, emergency room, you are sent for blood work, you're no longer a part of that wait time. You go in there, they send you for an MRI, same thing, you're automatically taken out of that, uh, that wait time. The NDP was actually transparent in how we counted patients. We counted them from the time you walked into the door until the time you left the hospital. 
This government has not been transparent with Manitobans. They're actually hiding uh, the amount of time that people are waiting in the ER. And I actually visited the ER uh, this summer, actually. And I mean, the, the things I saw in that ER, and I talked to one of the doctors, and he's just like, we're, we're, we're doing the best with what we have. You know, this government expects us to do more with less, and uh, it's really having a strain on our mental health and uh, the nurses' mental health and all of the frontline workers that are working there. And this government has not been listening to, you know, our concerns and have just continued to, to push through with their changes and, uh, you know, don't really care what we think, even though they're, we're the ones that are delivering the services. Um, we had to actually go by ambulance, and there is actually an ambulance that is uh, actually two fire halls that are maybe one that's two kilometers and the other one maybe is six kilometers from our house. And we were told on the phone that we would have to wait 13 minutes. So my husband was timing, and it was actually 15 minutes, 15 minutes that it took the firemen to get there. The ambulance hadn't even arrived yet. It was the firemen that came. And they came in our house, they did whatever. Uh, then we went to the emergency room. And I mean, the, the emergency room, we came in and it was, it was pretty uh, scary. We didn't get to see a doctor right away because every, like it was so busy in there. The, the waiting room was full of people. Like they took us right in the back because it was a real emergency. But like I said, we didn't see a doctor right away. My aunt was just admitted uh, maybe a month ago. And you know, the service she got with what they're, they're dealing with was impeccable. But again, you know, this government has created a system of, of putting these people in, in stressful situations when they shouldn't be because, uh, you know, they're, they don't want to make mistakes, but does this government care? No, they don't. Um, I want to talk a little bit about safety in our community. You know, this, uh, this government expects everybody else to keep our community safe and they've done nothing. I think about the Bear Clan and we've said it, we've asked this government to give the Bear Clan more money, give the Bear Clan more resources to give the Aboriginal youth opportunities uh, some funds as well, to actually do some prevention work. Because this government is very reactive, and reactive like maybe a year after things are happening. So maybe a year from now we'll see some action from this government, but I doubt it. You know, we'll continue to see more deaths and possibly young people dying. We have a crystal meth crisis in our community. Uh, the 7-Eleven on Isabel and, uh, or, yeah, Isabel and Order William just closed down this week because of the amount of thefts. And, you know, this government has done nothing to address uh, the, the safety of workers, but also to address the root causes of why people are doing this. We know that people are living in poverty. We know that people don't have adequate housing. We know that they're underfunding people in all kinds of ways. They've frozen wages for people and they expect people to do more with less. And this government can care less. We had a community forum where we had over 400 people that attended in the North End. And it wasn't just people or folks from the North End. It was people from West St. Paul. It was people from St. Vital. It was people from Southdale. There was people from all over. Lajmonier that came to this, this uh, community forum to be listened to, to hear, uh, to help their, uh, their, their elected officials listen to some community solutions. And we invited, you know, uh, the government to come. Did they come? No, of course. They, they could care less about listening to community. They say they consult. They don't consult. They do what they're going to do. They speak to their boss. Their boss tells them, nope, not happening. Too bad, so sad. Don't attend that. Don't go. So, you know, I, I, I'm very frustrated, to say the least, with this government and their lack of uh, community consultation around safety. 
Have they met with any of the community members who are directly affected? No, they don't care. And again, I'm in a preface that they can't uh, have the time of day to get up and actually talk about uh, their leader's throne speech. They, they show that they don't support it by not standing up and talking about it. Like, this is something that your government put forward and you can care less about standing up and talking about it. This tells me that you don't even support what your own government has put out. You know, I think about, you know, all of uh, the MLAs on that side and I, I worry about their mental health as well. And if they're even able to have a voice within their caucus, because I don't hear the voice of the people on that side. What I hear is cut, 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 cut at the, 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 uh, at the people and uh, really, you know, have, could care less about those that are struggling. So I want to say to the MLAs on that side, uh, have some courage, speak up, you know, don't always go what your boss says, and actually stand up for Manitobans in this house, because that's what you're elected to do. The Honourable Member for the Maples. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I'm humbled to stand here today to represent the Maples. Maples is one of the most diverse riding in Manitoba. I have lived in this area for roughly 30 years, and I had the opportunity to see growth in our community. I am a Sikh, I'm a, also a proud member of the Sikh community. On November 12, 2019, we celebrated Guru Nanak Dev Ji's 550th birthday. Guru Nanak Dev Ji is the founder of Sikhism. Guru Nanak Dev Ji, Dev Ji's three teachings are med meditation of God, earning a honest living, share wealth among society. Guru Ji's con contribution to the communities are threefold. A culty of the hum human, equality of the women, and universal masses for all, all the people. I want to congratulate all the people who were celebrate, celebrating Guru Nanak Dev Ji's 550th birthday. I would also like to tell the house about myself. Most of you have known me by Mintu Sandhu. That's my nickname. <laughs> my real name is Sukhjinder Paul Singh Sandhu. Well, there are 26 letters in alphabet, and guess how many letters are in their mind? <laughs> 24 letters. <laughs> My birthplace is Tanir, Punjab, India. My father's name is Jagtar Singh Sandhu, and mother's name is Sukhdev Kaur Sandhu. My father was a farmer, and mother was a housewife. I completed middle school in Tanir, Punjab, India, and complete, completed grade six in Sant Isar Das High School, Moom, Punjab, India. My sister sponsored us to join her in Canada in search of a better future for their kids, for their family. My parents immigrated to Canada on June 30th, 1989 with my father, mother, brother, and I landed at Vancouver International Airport. After staying one night in Vancouver at my auntie's house, we arrived in Winnipeg on July 1st, 1989. Looking out the window of the plane, I saw firework. Order. When this matter is again before the House, the Honourable Member for the Maples will have 17 minutes remaining. The hour being 5 p.m., the House is now adjourned and stands adjourned until 1.30 p.m. tomorrow.